Yeah. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to this afternoon's uh, License Commission meeting, Wednesday, June 7th, 4 p.m. This meeting is being Zoom recorded. Um, present this afternoon, myself, Natasha Yakovlev, Commissioners Helen Kahn and Jennifer Ewers. And is there anybody here for general public comment? This is not in relation to any of the agenda items. Are either of the two hands raised here for one of the public hearings? Because that's a separate opportunity for public comment. You are, okay. And the second hand, Rebecca Muller? No, you're here for general public comment? No, okay, you're here for hearing. Okay, great. Um, is anybody, how many people are here to speak to the Bombix public hearing? Can we use the hand raising? Yeah, can you, you well, I just want to get the count so I can figure out how many people. Yeah, can you use your little Zoom hand also? Thanks. So the, the reason I'm asking is because the Bombix folks have an event at 5 p.m. and we are making an effort to get them to that event, but we also have to allow public comment to happen at the hearing and each person gets three minutes to speak. If we have more than a certain number of people speaking, then we're just gonna have to bump the hearing to the end of the agenda, um, which was um, not ideal for the Bombix people, but it's gonna have to be what it is. So people here to speak for Bombix, I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So what we're going to do then, Cassandra and Kyle, I apologize, but we're just going to hop into the rest of the agenda for the meeting because we want to make sure that your agenda item has time and that all the people who came to speak are able to, um, to do that. All right. Are the rest of the commissioners on board with the plan? Okay, great. So moving on then. The agenda item number four, applications for the short-term liquor licenses. We have the trustees of the Forbes Library, 20 West Street, seeking a wine and malt license with a requested fee waiver for June 8th from 5 to 8 p.m. This is an artist reception for Shark, Vigent, and Sachs. July 8th from 3 to 5.30, the event reception for Sproul and Fahey. And August 3rd, 5.30 to 8 for an event reception, artist reception for Weir, Greenbaum, and Gettler. And do we have somebody from Forbes here? Yeah. How are you? Good. Haven't seen you in a while. It's been a while. We're happy to see you because it means you have things happening. Yeah, exactly. I'm very right. happy we have things, Good. things happening again and people coming yeah. in. Um, do you want to let us know about your events? Uh, well, they're they're pretty much all the same idea. They're wine and cheese and crackers um, with the artists, two, two artists in uh, July, I believe it is, and um, three tomorrow and in August and three in August. So pretty great. excited to have the activity back. Yeah, no, that is great. Um, do the other commissioners have other questions? Uh, I, I don't, I mean, it, you're just going to run these how you've run them in the past and you've experienced doing this and it looks like all the documents are submitted. Yes. So, um, so I don't have further questions. No, I do not have any questions. Thank you for submitting complete paperwork. Yes. Would somebody like to make a motion? Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the applications for short-term liquor licenses for the trustees of Forbes Library at 20 West Street for wine and malt as detailed in item four on the agenda. Second. And Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Item number five, applications for short-term liquor licenses for Building 8 Brewing, 320 Riverside Drive in Florence. This is for a beer release party, and you are seeking a wine and malt license for Friday, June 23rd, 3 to 8 p.m., Saturday, June 24th, 12 to 8 p.m., and Monday, June 26th, 12 to 6 p.m. And do we have O'Brien here? Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, there you are. Hello. Yep, hi. Sorry, I've got a little bit of work going on and I had to step outside real quick. No problem. Thank you for being here. Sure. So let us know what you are up to for your release. 
Uh, we are, uh, we've got a whole bunch of beer that we're packaging. Uh, we fell a little behind in brewing. So uh, around that week, we'll actually have a whole bunch of new offerings and uh, we're on our way to applying. So we were trying to squeeze in a little bit of a release party before we uh, couldn't apply for any one, more one day licenses. And hopefully the next time you'll be seeing me will be to uh, talk about our full-time pouring permit. That would be great. We look forward to that also. Yeah, so we're going to be like releasing our Pilsner, we'll have our Key Lime, we'll have like a lot of these special summer beers, and uh, just hoping to sort of, uh, you know, uh, show off the new bathroom, because our work will be done here in the next couple of weeks, so uh, we'll have uh, new bathrooms and some new seating and stuff like that, but uh, mostly just the regular, uh, we'll set up some picnic tables and all that kind of stuff, but uh, nothing, nothing too crazy, just wanted to be able to give an opportunity to people to have some of the new summer beers while we're while we're doing it so yep so this is all your setup is going to be outside of the brewery not in the courtyard yes correct okay yep okay a lot lower key yep questions from helen or jennifer uh, i do not have any questions now oh brian i know you do this a lot but will you have water and crackers and snacks as you have previously uh, oh yeah, of course. Yeah, we we have a uh, we have a um, a water cooler in in the tap room that's always full with filtered water, and I always make sure we have some like and a seltzers. And if any kids come, we always tend to give free juice boxes for kids. But we'll always have some kind of snacks. Uh, for one of those dates, we're going to arrange something with uh, Fub Boston and hopefully get some delivery going from them, which worked out really great at one point. Um, and I'm working on getting a, uh, some food in here for that Saturday or Friday, whichever day, you know, would be better. They tend to soften up a little bit on the weekends in the summer, so they appreciate the extra business over there. Excellent. So, yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. Then is there a motion? Uh, make a motion to approve the applications for short-term liquor licenses for building a brewing at 320 Riverside Drive in Florence as detailed in item five on the agenda. Second. Uh, Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Terrific. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Item number six, application for a transfer of a common victual license for TKP Hospitality Company DBA Friendly's Restaurant. The proposed manager is Tom Patton. Do we have someone here from Friendly's? Hello. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Do you wanna let us know about this change that's happening? Yeah, I am um, buying the uh, Friendly's location on Main Street in Florence, um, buying it from corporate Friendly's. It was transferred to them a year ago from the previous franchisee. Uh, so I will, the transfer is taking place on Monday, the 12th. And uh, I will be, uh, I have a manager in place. I'm, I'm taking over that one and the one over in Hadley. I have managers in place uh, in both locations, but I will be there on a daily basis overseeing uh, the operation. Great, that's exciting. It is, I am very excited. Yeah. Um, are there questions from Helen or Jennifer? Uh, I don't have questions. I'm just glad to see it will hopefully continue as a thriving business. Yep. Absolutely. And I think we were missing some of your paperwork. Will you be able to send that in soon? He actually, he did submit it today. Oh. I got everything today. Perfect. Great, thank you. Thank you. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add, Tom, before we go to a motion? I uh, know, just uh, invite you all to uh, come enjoy uh, the libations, not yes. libations, but the, the food. And we have right. uh, some new menu items coming out next uh, week. Ice well, cream? So. <laughs> And ice cream. And the ice cream, nice. Great, well, thank you and welcome to Florence. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion from a commissioner? Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the application for a transfer of a common victual license uh, as detailed in item six on the agenda. Second. Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you, good luck. Thanks. Item number seven, we have a public hearing on an application for a new seasonal wine and malt restaurant license for Masa Mexicano LLC at 176 Pine Street in Florence. And the proposed manager is Roberto Saravia. And I apologize if I mispronounced that. That's uh, okay. Thanks. I'll make a motion to open the public hearing. Second. 
And do we have anybody here for public comment for Masa Mexicano? Not seeing any, we'll jump right in. Hello. Oh, Hello, wait, no. Yep, sorry, hold on. We do have public comment, Cassandra. Hold on, let me. Um... Sorry, Annie, I always forget to mention the Zoom hand. Oh no, that's okay, I just need to unmute. It'll only be three more years before I figure that out. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Hello. Um, I wanted to speak in favor of Masa Mexicano's application. They have been an excellent partner with us here at Bombix. Um, you know, patrons coming for our events often stop there to pick, you know, to grab a meal on the way here or after a show. It's wonderful to see that restaurant thriving. They've also been incredibly generous and provided food for us for events like the Power of Truth Conference and some of our touring artists. So I'm really excited for them to now expand their offerings and really make this section of the neighborhood, you know, even more vibrant. I love the outdoor seating. It's just been a delight working with them. So I just wanted to share my support. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak to this item? There are two hands up. Um, I don't see everybody. There's... Um, Roger Sorkin. I th there we go. Roger, are you are you uh, wishing to make a comment for Masa Mexicano? No. Okay, your hand. Okay. All right. I think that's it then for comments. Okay. Great. Let's jump into the hearing itself then. Um, all right. Here we go. So how about Roberto, you just talk, let us know about your business and what your plans are for the license and. Okay. Uh, so like my name is uh, Roberto Sarabia, um, first time business owner. So I'm fairly new at this. Um, so my, uh, I'm mainly a taqueria. We do our own tortillas every morning. Uh, we make everything from scratch. Um, I want to work with um, local uh, beer vendors also to bring beer in and uh, just expand the um, the experience for the customers because I do get a lot of um, customers asking we serve beer or wine. Um, I am also working uh, also on a crowdfunding grant to get a few pieces of equipment in there. So if I get the license, I want to start with beer. And then once I get the equipment that I need to be able to provide glasses, I want to serve the wine. So you'll um, just like cans and or bottles of beer to start? Yeah, yes. Okay. Um, and then once I have the proper dishwashing machine out, I want to go with the uh, with beer uh, with wine also. Just I don't want to be serving wine in a plastic cup. Yeah. <laughs> Understood. And if there's anything that you guys need me to do, also. I am also planning on, on buying a, a card reader just to make life easier for everybody and don't have any problems with anybody. Yep, I think that's a great idea. Um, Jennifer and Helen, any questions? Uh, any yeah, I don't have questions. I just, just a comment. I love your restaurant, as you may know. And, um, and I think this is great. If people have been asking for this, I think it's fantastic that you're working towards providing it for them. Thank you. And also, um, I do want to speak on behalf of Bombex too. I don't know if this is the right moment or wait till later. Um, yeah, you'd have to wait until the public, okay. just so it can be part of the hearing and on public record. Yes, thank you for understanding. Um, Annie, just a point of clar clarification, this application is just for indoors, not for the extension of premise, correct? Oh, good point. Um, well, I, I don't think it will, I don't, he might. I, I'm just thinking, I don't think he'll get the license by the time after dining's over. He might, though. Um, but he'd have to come back because yeah. it's not specifically on the agenda. Yeah. So, Roberto, if you get the license before outdoor dining stops, the the wine and beer can only be served inside until you come back and do an extension of premise. Okay. Thank you. Good to know that. Yeah. Thank no you problem. Um, then I'm going to make a motion to close the public hearing for discussion. Second. Um, Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. 
Great. Um, I think this is awesome. And Masa Mexicano is an amazing addition to the Florence neighborhood. We rely on it on the regular <laughs> on our busy days. So I'm really excited to see the business grow in this way. I have no, no issues. Yeah. My family also goes there. They're local for us and they're very responsible owners. And uh, yeah, I think this is a good opportunity for them. Great. Okay, Helen, <laughs> um, I, should I, shall I do it? Make let's do it. All right, I'll make a motion to approve the application for a new seasonal wine and malt restaurant license for Massa Mexicano at LLC at 176 Pine Street in Florence. Second. And Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Great, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Item number eight, we have a public hearing on an application for a change of officers, directors, and a change of manager on an annual wine and malt beverages package store license for River Valley Market, LLC, DBA, River Valley Co-op. The proposed manager is Jason Karen, and I will make a motion to open the public hearing. Second. Is there anybody here to speak public comment to this particular hearing item for River Valley Co-op? Raise your Zoom hand. I see no hands raised, Annie. I, yeah, yeah, I don't oh, either. Sorry, I'm just gonna close the door because there's yard happening outside. So sorry, there's a chainsaw outside my house and that will be untenable. Um, okay, so seeing no public comment, do we have the folks here from River Valley? Yep, I'm here. I'm Jason. Hello, Jason. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thank you. Um, so let us know about this change. Um, so we, we had a little bit of a change in our officers and directors of the board. Um, so we're updating that. And then Rochelle, our general manager, is spending most of her time in our main office in Florence, where I'm here in the Northampton store all the time, you know, 40 to 50 hours a week. So we're changing it. So I'm the resident manager on the license. Okay. Um, questions from Helen or Jennifer? No questions from me. No, no questions. The paperwork's complete. So thank you. All right. Do you have anything else you wanted to add, Jason? No, thank you. Just thanks okay, for your time. All right. Then I will make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Um, thank you. So I all the paperwork submitted. I have no issues. Same here. Same. All right. Um, Would you like to make a motion? Uh, I'll go for it. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the application for a change of officers, directors, and a change of manager on an annual wine and malt beverages package store license for River Valley Market LLC, DBA River Valley Co-op. Second. Natasha? Yes. Je uh, Helen? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much. Item number nine, we have a request by Blue Paws Inc, DBA JJ's Tavern, 99 Main Street in Florence for two temporary modifications to the existing entertainment license. We have Saturday, June 10th, 2023, 7 to 9 p.m. for the JJ's Tavern 10 year anniversary comedy show fundraiser and Saturday, September 30th from 2 to 6 p.m. for the annual Oktoberfest celebration with a live band. And hi, John. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm great. How are you guys? Good. So you are requesting a couple of changes. Uh, yes. Do you? Uh, yeah. Let Saturday, us know. Saturday um, with the weather permitting, of course, well, Saturday is our 10-year anniversary. Uh, we're doing a comedy show uh, with Tim Lovett from Comedy is a Weapon in Northampton, and it's a fundraiser for uh, the Sojourner Truth um, statue down in Florence. They're looking to get some money to help refurbish, maintain, and keep um, keep it vibrant in that in that part of the park there. So uh, we've teamed up with Comedy as a Weapon, and we're going to donate the proceeds from the show back to them. Um, and 
the reason for the request is that it 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 the show will push past our 8 30 curfew to nine and i just wanted to be on the up and up with that um yep and i think your your license is music outside not comedy did we land on that that there was no live comedy outside um i thought it was anything amplified i think your license says um your license says uh, buh, buh, buh. outdoor amplified music one night a week 5 30 to 8 30. okay so um what i w- would suggest if the other commissioners agree is that um if you could notify maybe pop a note in the neighbor's mailboxes and let them know you're having a pre-approved event or something uh, i could do that but i don't know how far yeah no i think Totally. I get that. I think there's because, there, because there's housing and there's there's mailboxes that I don't have access to. Yep. Um, yep. I think really just the 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 neighbors who had issues with the sound, it would be a courtesy. I don't sure. know that we would require it, but I think it just be it might be a preemptive courtesy to let people I have know. no problem doing that if Annie can get me the addresses because I'm not sure exactly. I know two 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 houses I know uh-huh. of the of the people, not the exact addresses. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, okay. So I have okay. no problem with okay. that. Okay. And it might be a moot point because it might rain, and that might right, not be. right, and it's this weekend too, so it's coming up. Yeah, we yeah we uh, yeah yeah, We're but sure. I didn't I didn't want to interrupt what your flow. It just occurred yep. to me. Um. So that was so that's the one in the tenth, and then for Oktoberfest. Oclo- that one goes beyond your license time too. Is that the yeah? I'll there's the time from yep. five thirty to eight thirty to two to six. Yep. Yeah, I don't. I don't have an issue with these. Do the other commissioners have thoughts? No, I don't. Um, congratulations on ten years. I need to yeah. say, fantastic. That's you Thank know you. such a, <laughs> a milestone. Um, and I like what you're doing with the proceeds. Um, from that show. So, and I appreciate you coming in front of us and and asking for this uh, modification. So, and I know that the um, uh, Floberfest you've done in the past and it's Mm. it's not been an issue. So, you know, people are sort of expecting that, I'm sure. And that'd be the last event of the year anyway. So it's kind of goes along the same, I timed it that way so that we just wouldn't run into October and just would end just that same day. So that'd be. Right. Yeah. 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 No. And um, Helen and Jennifer, is it complete overkill? Do you think to give the neighbors a heads up or do you think not necessary? If anybody were to call to complain, Annie could easily tell them that this license was approved. I guess yeah, that's how I see it. You know, I don't want to add but, work to your plate, John, because yeah, right. you know, like, and it's coming up and it may rain and all that kind of stuff. And I and, I, and an that. anniversary event. I mean, come on, like this this a special one time. Yep. Um, okay. That's fantastic. Okay. Um Anything else from John or the commissioners? No, not for me. No? Okay. Can we get a motion then? I'll uh, make a motion to approve the request by Blue Paws Inc. DBA JJ's Tavern, 99 Main Street, Florence, for two temporary modifications to the existing entertainment license as detailed in item nine on the agenda. Second. Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Great. Thank you, John. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, John. And happy anniversary. Thank yes, you. happy anniversary. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right. Next up, item agenda number 10. We have an application for a new entertainment license for Gombo Oyster Bar LLC at 159 Main Street. The proposed entertainment is Fridays, 9 to 1 a.m. indoors, live acoustic music. And do we have somebody here? Hi, yeah. Uh, my name's Naya. I'm the general Hello. manager. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, thank you. Um, can you let us know about your plans? Yeah, so we just want to have a live, like New Orleans style jazz. Um, probably one musician, but it could be like two musicians. Um, but we made a, we contacted someone who used to live in New Orleans and who's familiar with the music and he's willing to come in every week. Um, we just want to do like one night a week, possibly two nights a week. Um, just like during dinner hours, maybe a little later. Um, but yeah, just just for like entertainment, like set the ambiance for the for the restaurant. 
and we'd mm-hmm. do it in the front. Um, I don't know if you've been in, but it's by the front where the windows are, we'd remove those three tables. So they yep. just have a small space. And when you specify acoustic, do you mean not amplified? Yeah, yeah, it would just be like like just their live instruments. Okay. Um, Jennifer and Helen. Um, sorry, just rereading the application. I had a question on the diagram, but I think Naya explained it. And if the music's not amplified, then and it, it does sound pretty small scale. I'm I'm very comfortable with it. And now I understand what she's saying. I do know what you mean by the front windows. Yeah, it's just like right on the street when you when you walk into the restaurant. Um, yep. And if it, I'm not entirely sure if the musician's planning to amplify it. So if he was, would I have to come to another meeting to get that part approved? Um, we just like to be, we're trying to be really clear with the entertainment licenses that we're giving so that we have an understanding of what's happening. The, the issue for that is because you do have residences upstairs okay. um, that, you know, we want to be mindful about what we're licensing and, and make it clear to the, any license holder who has immediate residential abutters know that it, you know, it would probably be a good idea to follow suit of what Strong Avenue has done for their summer on Strong, which was they notified all of their um, residential abutters on that whole street of what their plans were for, um, for the summer on Strong music series. And I would really encourage you to do the same thing so that one, it's just a nice neighborly thing to do. And two, it opens up that line of communication. So if something does is experienced in a negative way by the people upstairs, they can talk to you about it and it doesn't become um, an issue. And we would hope that if there were complaints that they would be responded to um, with attempts to do some mitigation for the sound. Okay, yeah, definitely, that makes sense. Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember what are, what time do you close on Fridays? Because it's we, this is specifically for Fridays in the application. It looks yeah, like. we close at 10 p.m. as of right now. Um, but like, if people wanted to stay just to, like listen to music, um, we would allow that basically. So that's why I extended the time. But obviously, if no one's here, the music would just end um, at our closing time. Do, now I'm just curious, like from our logistically, from our point of view, because um, you have a wine and malt license, and d- d- are there hours stated on that license? And is it? I guess my question is, can they just modify it on a whim, or is it something now that with that other license they have to actually say that they're going to be open later? I guess that's a question for Annie. Yeah, I was going to. I don't know I off the top of my head what hours are on the license, but um, they can't just be changed on a whim. They need to, um, the commission needs to be notified. And there, it's a simple um, application. There's not even really, there's no fee. Um, and we do need to notify the ABCC as well, but um, there's no application or fee. Okay, so if I, like, if I look on our license and it, the time is like until 10 p.m., um, I just have to fill something out to change it to a later time. Is that what you're Yeah, yeah. We can okay. talk offline about that, about how okay. about that. Yeah. And and I guess the part of the reason I was asking about what the hours are is because I um, would recommend maybe that music stops like sort of half an hour before closing. I mean, although I know that the whole point now of staying open later is to to have um, music and um, oysters looks like um, yes and the bar open. Uh, but yeah, so I guess I was asking because I didn't know if if your hours were originally till one, then I would recommend that maybe music stops at twelve thirty or twelve forty five. But it may okay. be. But now I I guess we don't know what the the closing time is. Just I guess you know so people aren't lingering. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Um. So I don't know where that leaves us. Is this um is this something if we are to go ahead and and uh, approve this application? Is it contingent upon um just Annie, do you have thinking access, of the hours <laughs> yeah do you have access to their license I, I don't and I can't get I can't get my work files on this computer okay um yeah it would be nice if if our uh, motion could include the time that's reflected on your current license because that would be the time that you would need to end yeah I can it's 
hanging on the wall. So if it's, it, would it just be stated on that license? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's on the, the bottom okay. right. All right, just give me one second. I'm just gonna go. Thank you. Can you unmute Naya, Annie? Oh, she's, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I didn't realize she was muted. Hey, sorry. Thank <laughs> you. Um, it says until 10 p.m. on okay. the license. Okay. So well, that's actually, actually, it says until the one for inside says until 1 a.m. And then the one for outside says until 10 p.m. Okay. So it'd be, so then we would just, we would say like 1230 to stop music. Is that what you were saying? That was my suggestion. I don't know how the other commissioners feel. But. Yeah, no, I definitely think wrapping up the music prior to your actual closing time would be good. Okay. Yeah. And we always tell folks who are getting new entertainment licenses that it's subject to future meetings. If there are issues and you come forward, we may have to amend the license. Okay. Okay. Um, I have one other item to, to discuss with you that's not on the agenda, but if we want to do the motion for this piece first. All right. And then one other question with this motion, are we um, just saying live music or are we uh, limiting it to live acoustic just to. I would say live acoustic, which is what in the application. Okay. So if it were to be amplified, I'd come back for yeah. a separate one. Okay. Yeah. To have it updated. Yeah. Okay. I don't think it is. Amplified, but just in case, it's, it's, it's such a small space that I yeah. really don't think it needs to be. Yeah. Okay. Um, can I though then in the motion um, uh, specify 12.30 a.m. because it doesn't read quite like that on the application itself. But yep. that's fine, okay. Folks ready, should I go? Yes. I'll make a motion to approve the application for a new entertainment license for uh, Gombo Oyster Bar, LLC, 159 Main Street. Uh, for Fridays, 9 p.m. to 12.30 a.m. indoors, live acoustic music. Second. Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Great. Okay, so that's the good news, Naya. There's a little bit of bad news, Naya. Okay. <laughs> so we has come to our attention that your cocktail menu has drinks that have vodka, tequila, and or rum in mm -hmm. them. You have a wine and malt license and a cordial license. And the cordial license is very specific to each alcohol that you have in a cocktail. So it's not the overall sugar content of the cocktail itself. Every single bottle in your establishment has to have a tax stamp on it that it's either a cordial or a liqueur. And vodkas, tequilas, and rums don't fall under that category. So we were, our distributors told us that it just has to have a percentage of sugar right. in the alcohol. So like 2.5%. So right. all the, all the liquor, so like the tequila we're using, it's like a lime tequila and a grapefruit tequila, and then like a citrus vodka. So they all have like that percentage of sugar in it is what we were told by our distributors. Yeah. So we've been through this before when we first started issuing cordial licenses and what we decided to do based on advice from the ABCC was that a cordial is only a cordial if it has a cordial stamp on the bottle or okay. liqueur, which those, if distributors are saying there's a sugar content in a vodka or a tequila, that doesn't make it a cordial, that just makes it a vodka or a tequila that has a sugar content in it. And we need to make the differentiation because there's a separate all alcohol license that would cover the vodkas and the tequilas and the rums and all of those things. So it's oh, technically, okay. yeah, so it's technically a separate thing. 
Okay. And it's an easy mistake to make, but it's, we made this decision previously based on guidance from the ABCC um, so that it would have a clear distinction. Okay. Okay. So it's a big, yeah. Cause our, our liquor distributors just like, they told us we would, they wouldn't like sell us things we weren't allowed to have. So that's why I'm just confused. Oh, yep. That um, it is confusing. And Annie, if you have anything to add to it from when we went through this before, from the guidance we got from the ABCC. Um, all I would add is that there is a, we have a PDF document of acceptable cordials from the ABCC that I can share with you that might be helpful. Okay. Yeah. Um, that, that would be helpful. Um, okay. What should we do with like, cause we already have these order cause we weren't like, we had no idea. We weren't allowed oh, to have these things totally just because we went through our distributors yep. and they, no, it's okay. an honest mistake. Totally honest. Okay. Mistake. Yeah, no, it's an honest mistake. Um, you'll need to stop serving them. Those, those three in particular, and Annie can email, when can you get her that list? Um, I can forward it right now. Okay. She'll yeah. send it to you now. So you can just review it and, and cross check it with what you have in stock. And then maybe tomorrow, um, Annie, are you in the office tomorrow? Yes. You can call Annie with follow-up questions. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I don't want to, I'm not like trying to blindside you with this news. Just, wow. Well, oh, yeah, I had, I had no idea. I had no yeah. idea. It's, no, it's totally fine. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. All right. So I'll tell John. So it just can't even be in on the premise now. It can't be available for serving, correct? Okay. okay. Yeah, just not on your bar. Just pull it for the time being. Okay. Yeah. Right? So I'm okay. certainly hoping that those distributors who maybe misled you will, uh, will reimburse when you return. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Talk to them about that. <laughs> Wait. Okay. All right. Anything else? No, that's it. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. I hope everything's going well. It's it's great to see yeah. you guys open and busy every time I go by. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. All right, item 11, application for a temporary outdoor dining extension of premise into a private parking lot. This is Saratoga Sports Bar Incorporated, DBA, the office, 325 Riverside Drive. This is for approximately 300 square feet with six tables and 15 chairs. And do we have Phil Akers here? Yep. Hello. How are Hi. you? Oh, yeah. Good, thanks. So can you walk us through your plans? Um, just have some outdoor seating for people to go outside and sit outside and have some drinks. And uh, I have somebody cooking on a grill that has something going on on the weekends. Right now, they have with the Board of Health and everything, they got it all set up for the permits. Okay. So, so permits are in, they're already in hand or they're pending? No, he already has it. Okay. Okay. And I see on your, um, you're going to have fencing. Um, I see on your map that you have a spot for music. Yeah. I put that in because I know you guys needed a spot, um, like some kind of written design you needed for yep. um, the last the entertainment license. Yep. We're kind of, it. I just put added it on there and I have a, I have another one without it, but yeah. So have you have you put together a plan to have outdoor music yet? Because I know when you came before you you were leaving the opportunity you wanted to have the opportunity to do it, but you didn't have any plans yet. Yeah, not not yet. Kind of okay. seeing how uh, I'll try it indoors first. <laughs> yep, yep. I think that's great. So, okay, and then then maybe outdoors. <laughs> okay, um, Helen and Jennifer, do you have anything? Any questions, comments? Yeah, so remind, refresh me. You do have an indoor entertainment license or you're just talking about at some point you may, okay. We I do have one. Something that we, yeah. Could, yeah. So I guess what we're saying is, yeah, if you were to move music outside, then it would be another, it would be an amendment, you know, that correct. Mm -hmm. You'd have to come in front of us again because as we well know, outdoor music has caused a lot of issues in yeah. our community recently. So, so every, every yeah. time, Every time I would, if I want outdoor music, I have to apply with you guys. For Meaning it. like, or to amend the whole license for the annual entertainment license to, to 
right? It's, correct me if I'm wrong, Annie. Let's, yes. Let's, so Dr. Correct me. <laughs> he, he came, um, I, a, a meeting, I don't know if it was last month or the month before, and for an outdoor entertainment license. And it was granted contingent upon receiving a floor plan. Um, we did that. Okay. Yes. Which yeah. I think, <laughs> are you, are you hoping that the design that you've submitted for this extension of premise is used as the floor plan for the entertainment license? Well, if, if I can, that's where I would, I would put it right there. Cause that's where the power is. And they need some kind of power for them to plug in. If I have something outside. And you've got the six six tables in that space, right? Yeah, I got I got four really. Okay. And I put and how many tables do you have inside? How because you have a bar inside. Yeah. Then I got some high tops, and then I got some lower ones in the pool room. Yeah. Of I don't know one two. Okay. Six six in the pool room. Yeah. And uh, four out out in the uh, bar area. Okay. So if there were, if, if you had some music outside and you wanted to bring more tables outside, that would alter this plan. So that would trigger another change. So it's just more, you know, just think through those details. So if I want to have the six, it's okay, but. I mean, there's six on the, on the design. Yeah. You've yeah. 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 Okay. Jennifer, do you have anything? I don't. I'm fine with the plans as he submitted them. I think it's fine. Okay. Helen? Yeah, I guess I have a question for, so um, if we are approving this, are we simultaneously saying that um, we're, this is finalizing the entertainment license and allowing outdoor entertainment, or is that a separate thing? It's, if, if this, well, we should, I guess, close out that contingency from the last time, but if this uh, map that he's provided satisfies us to act as what we need on file for his outdoor uh, floor plan, yep. then yes. If it doesn't, then speak now, <laughs> if, right. you, if it doesn't satisfy you. Um, I mean, I guess it works as a floor plan. I am, <laughs> apologize that I needed to be refreshed that we agreed to the yeah. license contingent on that. And so is, and is that for the same hours that are written here until 12 a.m.? And is it every night of the week I, or Monday through Sunday? And yeah, it was, a, oh, sorry, go ahead. It's, I can't remember what the hours were. I don't think they were late though it's, on the entertainment license. Okay. It's Thursday through Saturday from seven to 10. Okay, that makes me feel better. That's what I'm gonna <laughs> say. <laughs> it's like, what have we done? Um, okay, so I'm all good. <laughs> Great. All right, would somebody like to make a motion? I think it's you, Jennifer. Oh, I'm so sure. I propose. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I've got it here. I have 4,000 pages. So I propose we move forward on a motion to accept the application for a temporary outdoor dining extension of premise into a private parking lot for Saratoga Sports Bar Incorporated doing business as the office 325 Riverside Drive. We're approving approximately 300 square feet, which includes six tables and 15 chairs as described on item number 11. This floor plan will also satisfy the contingency that was passed at the last license commission requiring a sketch. Second. Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Great. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sure thing. All right, then now let's move on to the hearing relative to the potential modification of entertainment license held by Bombic Center for Arts and Equity located at 130 Pine Street in Florence. So this is a public hearing. So this how this is gonna happen is I'm gonna open the public hearing and then ask for public comment. Hey, raise your little Zoom hand and Annie is going to unmute you as we go along so that each person will have the opportunity to speak before we have a conversation with the Bomb Mix folks. Um, make a motion to open the public hearing. Second. 
And uh, Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Great. And I appreciate everybody's patience. I know everybody's been here since four o'clock. We just wanted to make sure you all had an opportunity to speak. And it's uh, Annie, I don't know what how you want to go in order of the Zoom hands. Um, yep, so I guess Elizabeth is first. Okay. So I will start the timer once she is. Yes, up. everybody has three minutes to speak if you want the full three minutes. Are we, am, am I on? You are on. Am I up? Okay, great. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Dunaway. I am the uh, board president at Bombex. And so I just wanted to um, start off by um, saying that, you know, as, as the board president, you know, and the board in general, you know, it's our job to make sure that Bombex is um, following through on their mission, but it's also our job to make sure that we remain economically viable. And so uh, we've been very concerned about all the stuff that's been happening with Bombix. And so I wanted to come out and support um, our organization. Um, and I wanted, to, I wanted to start with saying that, um, you know, we, we um, were forwarded the letters by the neighbors. They did not send them to us directly, by the way, but we were forwarded these two letters by the neighbors. Um, and I want to start with saying that I, um, I vehemently object to the representation that we've not been a good neighbor. We have been working <laughs> with the neighbors um, for since since we began. We've been having um, meetings over and over where you remain in email co contact. We let them know what's going on. Um, we've made several voluntary concessions for them. We end our shows an hour earlier than we need to. Um, we have put significant cost into making sure that we have parking attendants and parking signs and trying to make the parking work better. We've spent, we've spent extra money on sound measuring equipment so that we can continue to monitor the sound and make sure that we're staying within um, all the ordinances that we're supposed to do. Um, so I just wanted to start by saying that. And I, we did submit a letter that kind of um, spelled a lot of that out. So hopefully um, the commissioners had a moment to, to read that. Um, we have spoken to several other neighbors who, um, right in the immediate area who do not share the same concerns as these neighbors. So um, I just wanted to make a point. It's not a universal feeling. It's a, it's a handful of people who, who are, who are feeling this way. Um, and the, what's really hard for us is that we have tried to be good neighbors. We're not going away, so we can't give them everything they want because we're going. We exist, and and we're happy to be there. And I think that we're very important to the vitality of Florence and what's going on there. Um, but they, what's been going on has caused Bombix um, severe economic harm. We've lost um, over thirty thousand dollars because of the shutdown, um, because the fire department was called, because of neighbor complaints. Um, we have long-term loss of rental revenue because um, we're no longer allowed to even have one-day licenses in the building until we have sprinklers. Um, and we have, um, and now our investment priorities have, have shifted to, to, to put sprinklers in the forefront, which is fine, which is great, but it also means that um, some of the things we were going to do. Sorry. Is my time up? Yeah, sorry. Okay, and let me just finish that sentence. Some of the things we were going to do have now been pushed to the side. So thank you for the time. Thanks for having this meeting. And thank I'm going speaking. Away. Thanks. Annie, I'm gonna rely on you to just go in a, some sort of order that makes sense for you with the hands. All right, looks like that's me. Uh, I'm Marissa Eggerstrom. I'm the pastor here at Florence Congregational Church, and I'm speaking in support of keeping Bombix's license uh, just the same. As a pastor, it's really clear when nimbyism just becomes a form of bullying. Uh, we all know the acronym, right? Not in my backyard. But it's a form of bullying of the haves over the have-nots. Not everybody has their own private home in which to entertain and gather those they want to be with. And so after three years of the pandemic, people need to gather more and more. We are a place that has always provided that opportunity. 
But here we have a handful of people who think they're entitled to literally change laws and regulations just to meet their specific preferences and comforts. It's an entitlement to think they can dictate how other people gather, when they gather, and even what kind of music they listen to. This is the part that I don't understand. These neighbors who are so aggrieved bought homes in a neighborhood absolutely full of community serving institutions. That's also right on the edge of an industrial district. All of those conditions predate those neighbors lifetime. Yet now they expect to police everything that happens here like this is a gated community in some redlined suburb. You better do what they want or they'll call the fire department on you. This is the logic of people who say they would have supported abolitionism, but would have called the cops a surgeon or truth got a little too loud or uppity. Of course, these neighbors say they support Bombix, but apparently only insofar as Bombix and the church and the synagogue and the preschool and the thousands of people our organizations serve cater to these neighbors whims and preferences. As a result of the bad faith dealings with the uh, fire department, I now have to tell anyone getting married here that there can be no champagne toasts at their weddings. Will these neighbors then want to determine who I can and cannot give communion to and whether we should have wine or grape juice? It's enough. Time to be enough with the bullying. These NIMBY neighbors have lost credibility. The regulations that are good enough for all of the rest of the people of Northampton are also good enough for Pine Street. Thanks. Okay. Um, Aislinn, my apologies if that is. Oh, no, that's perfect. No worries. Can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I am speaking in a dual role. I have been working at Bombax for a year and a couple months as the front of house manager, the kitchen manager, as well as the fundraising coordinator. I found out about Bombax because I'm a neighbor. And so during my COVID walk around the block when I was recovering from long haul and trying to figure out what to do with my life because I could no longer do my old profession, massage therapy, I saw one day that something was going on here. So I went in and I said, hello, and I found out, wow, somebody is starting to hold community events that are COVID safe outside in my neighborhood. So I started volunteering. And as a neighbor, I have never heard any of the sound coming from Bombax. I have asked everyone in my apartment complex, which abuts Bombax, we actually are backyard neighbors. Nobody in our neighborhood has ever heard any noise coming from Bombax. Um, and then as the front of house manager, part of my job is making sure that people are adhering to our parking laws as Elizabeth spoke about, not laws, excuse me, rules. As Elizabeth has spoken to, we have a parking attendant who makes sure that the people are not parking in front of our neighbor's um, driveways, that we're staying quiet as we go to our cars. And I have, I have never had any issues with any of our guests. They're lovely. There's never been any fights. There's never been any issues for us with alcohol. Um, when we do have a contractor who comes in with a temporary liquor license, everybody always adheres to staying in our cafeteria where we set up the space for them to enjoy the libations of building eight. So as a person who's working here as a manager and as well as a community member, I have just nothing but great things to say about Bombax and to have found that I was thinking about moving away from Florence and this space has made me engage even more in my community. Um, and I am very thrilled that we're here. So yep, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jarrett. Thank you, I'm Alex Jarrett, uh, High Street in Florence. I'm the city councilor for Ward 5, um, and Bombix is in Ward 5. Uh, first, thank you for scheduling the hearing. Uh, it's important that all voices be heard. And I first want to speak in support of Bombix. Um, they've brought an amazing array of diverse music and performance and art education, food, along with the religious services that they're partnering with, um, film. So this is this drives the local economy. It's an essential part um, also of preserving the historic church building. And I'm really glad that the shutdown was brief um, and that they've worked out a plan with the building department. 
I also recognize the need to address parking and traffic issues and want to let folks know this will be on the agenda for the June 20th Transportation and Parking Commission meeting. Uh, I agree that you know we may need to change parking regulations and I'll be closely following the recommendations. I also support traffic calming measures, which will improve the safety uh, at all times in, in the neighborhood. Um, also, Bombix must operate within the city's noise ordinances. And I support the building department taking independent measurements to, to verify their compliance. Uh, but I don't support any substantial changes to their entertainment license. Uh, I know this has been a big change for the neighborhood. I'm sensitive to their concerns. Um, and Bombix is one of the most uh, exciting things to happen in Florence recently. And they need our support uh, in order for Florence to thrive. So thank you. Roger Sorkin. Yes, hi, thank you. I actually, for all you Florence neighbors, I actually just had to chase a bobcat away from my chickens. Um, so beware, There's a, we saw a bear and a bobcat here today. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really disappointed to hear about the way this is being framed. I'm really disappointed in, in the pastor um, for describing this as nimbyism and bullies. Um, you know, I wouldn't expect that level of gaslighting from someone with your moral position. Um, there are, I have not met a single neighbor who is against Bombix. Um, we've written to the city, we've written to Bombix, we've met with them. We love having an arts organization like this in our neighborhood. Um, we've lived with having events here for many, many years when the church was active. Um, there's no problem with having this, and we recognize the value that this brings. Um, to blame the neighbors because the building was not compliant with, uh, with fire codes is incredibly disingenuous um, and just false. Uh, it was all news to us when we heard that the fire department was going out to, to inspect. Um, that's their business, that's their job. I mean, you know, who are we to say what the fire department should do? Uh, so let's please not get into these false debates we simply want what we've all been saying is we want Bombix to comply with noise ordinances, to not be permitted to exceed noise ordinances. We've had a lot of conversations with them about measuring sound. Uh, we still haven't seen those measurements. I, have, I haven't seen them at least. And, and I can tell you that the building that they're in, you know, whatever you say about the value of ha having them here, that building is not designed for the kind of amplified music that they have. There have been a lot of great events at Bombex. I've, I've been to events at Bombex. I like going to events at Bombex. Um, but on a Wednesday night, when they've got the amplifiers cranked up, and it's the kind of music that should be at the Academy, at the Academy of Music or at another venue, um, that's where we're starting to have issues. Um, so, so that's really what this comes down to. It's it do not exceed the noise limits for a residential neighborhood. That's all we're asking. That is all we've asked when it when the, the topic of, of noise has come up. Not to shut down Bombix. Um, there's there's been a very what I've observed to be a very uh, bad faith effort here uh, to just to, to frame this as nimbyism. Um, you know, and, and the fact that the pastor would call us bullies, I just, I'm, I'm so offended to hear you say that, Marissa. I just think that, that that's beneath you. Um, so no, this is not a question of shutting down a great organization. We just want you to be good neighbors. We want you to comply with residential noise ordinances. That's really what it's all about. Now, as far as parking goes, yes, you cannot go out and enforce parking laws. We need the city to do that. We've had our driveways blocked. Uh, we've had cars that are sticking out at the edge of Park Street and Pine. Um, I mean, that's a safety issue. Nobody wants a, a, a problem with uh, an injury or an accident. Uh, so we, we don't. I, at least, I don't think Bombix is responsible fine. for that. The city needs to enforce. Uh, but let's please frame this what, as what it is. Be good neighbors. That's that's what we're asking. Rebecca Muller. Hi, um, I'm Rebecca. Um, thank you for taking my uh, hand. Um, I am a neighbor and I live around the corner and I am delighted that Bombex is there and I am grateful that they're helping to 
maintain the diversity of the building and the community. And I think it's a, just a wonderful addition to many music venues in Florence area. And I just want to point out that I think that it's difficult to control sound levels in every concert. I've lived here for well over 40 years. I hear the performances from Look Park down on Little Old Nanatuck Street. Um, I, uh, Center Street folks used to have a, a wonderful family party uh, several weekends in the summer. I hear them. And, you know, I get mildly annoyed when I'm trying to drive by crowded parking areas, whether it's the Hill Institute or services or events at either the community center or, or you know, the Church Bombex building now. And it's kind of like the cost of doing business in a mixed community and neighborhood. I don't like the dumpsters that are across the street from me at a mixed business and residential zoning place at the medical center across from me at five of five in the morning. And, but that's the regulation that allows it. And I choose not to be a niggler when they come at quarter of five instead of five. It's just, it's the cost of doing business in this neighborhood. I don't like the toxic spills in, in the factory down the street from me. And I just appreciate the, the fact that we're all here trying to work these issues out. And I appreciate what was said about this moral high ground. Um, you know, it works both ways. My understanding is a lot of time the inspections offices and, and the fire department is a very complaint oriented business. And I suspect that once the letter got sent out, um, it did require people following up. I don't see it as a nightclub. I'm, I really hope the city can sort that out. It's so far from a nightclub. And I just hope things go smoothly um, because I think it makes us a very, very wonderful and vibrant community. And I hope that we can look at the whole picture. Thank you. Isaac, Luria. Hi, uh, I'm um, here to be in support of Bombex. I'm a neighbor, I live on Park Street um, and I am, yeah, I, I am not concerned about parking or noise. Uh, it has not been an issue for us. Um, we know that summer months bring events uh, and concerts at the VFW and other places. This is part of what it means to live in a vibrant neighborhood. I've been to multiple events uh, at Bombex, and to be honest, I was brought to tears sitting in a church uh, in this area that has such a storied history, listening to folks talk about Black liberation today. I think that is an incredibly moving role and a real honoring of the history that's here. Um, I guess I just want to say, too, uh, more than a neighbor, I also work in sort of national faith community stuff. And Bombex is a leading national model for how to save real estate that would otherwise be turned into other kinds of development um, by creating cost sharing opportunities uh, with cultural events, with daycares, with other uh, it, it makes a big difference. It preserves that building for something other than maybe condos. Uh, so I think this is a really wonderful uh, thing in the neighborhood, and I'm just here to speak in support. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Roberto Saravia. Yep. Hello. Um, so I am here because I am in support of Masa Mexicano. I mean, of uh, Bombex. I am the owner of Masa Mexicano down the street, um, Mexican restaurant. Uh, I would like to say the few days uh, the fire department had to shut down my business suffer, uh, great losses in revenue. Um, you know, we were, me and my team were ready to do a big number that day and all of a sudden we're like, oh, what's going on? It's so slow. And we went on their website and they were like, oh, 
they're they got canceled and we're like we're wondering what happened and so because of that um the whole weekend was low we, when we were expecting big numbers um in customers coming in and it's great too because we've seen so many customers from around the world we've seen musicians from siberia coming into the restaurant and looking at the al pastor spit and being amazed of the different types of food that they are not able to eat uh their country and having to ask so many questions about it and we're happy to let them know what we offer and what we do there also we have catered many events for them that have brought a lot of revenue to the restaurant and um i think it's a great um art venue for the community for florence um i haven't personally heard a lot of noise coming from them because I walked around when the shows are, are there and I haven't heard any noise coming in from them. I haven't seen any fights or anything going on. Uh, I haven't seen anything going on with traffic either. So uh, thank you to Bombix for being there and supporting Masa Mexicana also with uh, customers coming in. Um, thank you. Gabrielle. Hi. Yeah. Um, I'm here in support of Bombay X also. I'm a neighbor as well. I live on Park Street and um, I've been hearing the sounds of the VFW on wild nights down there and the concerts at the Civic Center and now the sounds from Bombay X and I love it. I think it adds to the community. It adds to the environment that we have here in Florence. Um, it sounds to me with the provocative things passed aside that the major issues by some of the neighbors, some of the other neighbors is the noise ordinance. So I would just encourage the panel to try to zero in the parties on hammering out any language that's needed for agreement on the noise ordinance because development happens and change is hard, but this is a wonderful way of things developing in Florence. So I say we should embrace it and just work with the neighbors on the noise ordinance issue and try to leave the other issues aside. But um, I hope they get to continue bringing great events to this area. Lisa Chase. Hi, thanks. Can you hear me all right? I'm Lisa Chase and I am, boy, I guess one of the bullying nimbyism neighbors. I gotta say, that was some really like harsh othering, really harsh, really detrimental rhetoric. And I don't think we need to go there. I live two doors down from Bombix. I fully support Bombix's mission. I fully support much of Bombix's programming. What I'm concerned about are the issues when um, Bombix is not complying with the noise um, issues or when there are parking concerns. And you know, I and, and other neighbors are trying to work very constructively um, with Bombix and with the city to address these problems. And boy, I, I have to say, I'm like still shaking. I just can't believe the yellering, the, the rhetoric about, you know, about bullying neighbors. It's, you know, come talk to us, come meet with us. We're, we're really not so bad. We're just trying to live our lives in peace. This is a residential area. I mean, I've, you know, I've been here for over 20 years never had problems with you know the church and the various events going there on there and all the other events happening in in our neighborhood i like being part of a vibrant neighborhood and as as roger and as you know many more neighbors will mention we love so much of bombix's programming and we go to many of bombix's events this is not the whole like i'm for bombix or i'm against bombix let's let's erase that I am for working together to address the issues at hand. Fully support Bombix's mission, 
fully support much of their programming and want to see it succeed. The issue is noise mitigation and parking safety issues that come from a slice of their program. Because this is a residential name neighborhood, it's really difficult when there are multiple shows that are loud, that are amplified in a building that's not meant for amplified sound or when there's outdoor shows. So that makes it challenging. And we wanna ask the city to make reasonable modifications to Bombix's entertainment license to address noise and parking concerns so that Bombex can continue with their programming without making it so challenging for um, immediate neighbors to live peacefully and um, enjoy the programming that is here. Thank you. Patricia Mahar. Um, hi, I hope you can hear me. Um, I um, am pretty much shaking over here. I cannot believe that pastor from the church has just said this about the neighbors and what she is saying about the neighbors. It is not like that at all. I agree 100% with Lisa and Roger. We just want to work together. The noise you know, uh, there are people in the neighborhood, maybe they live further down on Park Street. You don't hear the noise if you're coming from behind on Nonatuck, like you hear on Pine and where I am on Park. But I, I just am in shock that we can't work together on this. I, I agree. I agree Bombex has uh, got great programming, but we do not need to have these amplified music outside and um, coming out that, I mean, I like to go to bed early. I can't sometimes go to bed early because you can hear their music or the drums. And I, I just think that there's a way to work this out rather than calling being at the neighbors against Bombex because that's not what it is at all. But I probably have lived here longer than everyone I'm thinking in, in this house. And I can't, on Saturday night, I drove home and I couldn't pull into my driveway. I had to go around because someone was parked in the middle of the lane across the street from my house. And then cars were parked all down the other side. I could not walk my dog safely with the car, way the cars were parked on um, Park Street and um, Pine and around it, it, it's it, this is a residential neighborhood, and I don't understand how come JJ's is not allowed to go past eight thirty, but they can at Bombex when it's more of a residential neighborhood on this end of Park and Pine than it is in the center of Florence. So I'm. Um, I just would like Bombex to uh, follow the noise ordinance, and I'd like the city to follow up on that. I would like this. I would like the city to come and see the parking. You know, I'm Bombex has one person out there parking, and they've told me, "Sorry, I can't help you." You know, I'm trying to cross the street with my dog, and you, you, they, they, you can't even do that. And like, I've been here 60 years. I should be able to cross the street to get home. I should be able to pull down into my driveway and not worry about, you know, having to drive all the way around. So, but I, I'm blown away. Thank you. Uh, Patricia Stipe. Yeah, um, I've lived on Pine Street for 37 years, and I just wanted to speak up as a neighbor who um, is not bothered by the noise. Parking can be an inconvenience, but um, I don't see that as critical as some people here do. Um, I think that Bombex is a treasured resource for our community and should be fully supported. And I don't know, maybe I'm misinformed, but um, 
People keep saying that they just want North Ham that Bombex to follow the noise ordinances, but it appears to me that they're also asking to severely curtail the number of performances that um, Bombex holds. So um, that's all. Bob Silman. Hi. So I'm Bob Silman. I'm the director of the Young at Heart course. The group has been in existence for 41 years now, and we are so happy to have been embraced by Bombex as a resident company. Our rehearsal space history over those 41 years has been a bit of a journey. We've battled with many obstacles, including spaces being too small, us being too loud, and often being bumped for other programming. When I called Cassandra about the possibility of rehearsing at Bombix, it was so refreshing that she didn't see us as a rental, but as part of their vision for the arts in our community and for the well being of our elders. They have truly made the space available to us and are always thinking of ways they can improve on our experience there. You have no idea how different that is from what we have dealt with in the past from groups who simply rented us space. Young at Heart also shares similar beliefs about diversity and inclusion with Bombix. After the murder of George Ford like Floyd, like all local arts organizations, we came up with an equity statement. Everyone did. But Bombix walks the walk. Look at their programming. They have more people of color on stage and in the audience than any other presenting group in Northampton. Young at Heart is 30% BIPOC, and our goal is to make that 50%. It makes a significant difference to have partners like Cassandra and Kyle to help us achieve that goal. You know, Bombix harkens back to the early days of Florence when Samuel Hill worked tirelessly to create a utopian side society that welcomed the likes of Sojourner Truth, David Ruggles, and even Frederick Douglass. I know there were legitimate issues amongst neighbors back then, as there are now, but I'm also convinced that Bombix is committed to resolving those issues. Unfortunately, it's going to take time and money. To that end, Young at Heart will be giving a free concert courtesy of the Florence Civic and Business Association on Thursday, June 15th, Florence Summer Series. The concert is free, but we will be make, passing popcorn buckets to raise funds. That's not a shameless plug for Young at Heart, but a real plea for the community to get involved in the raising funds that are needed for safety, soundless elimination, and restoration of the amazing space that is now Bombix. Stephanie Pasternak. Hi, my name is Stephanie Pasternak. I live on Pine Street across from Bombix. Um, I first also am very upset by the vilification of people objecting to um, perpetual loud noise in their neighborhood. I, I think, or that, and also blaming the neighbors for shutting down Bombex as if we have the power and the ear of the fire department. I, I don't know where that leap came, but it, it's convenient for Bombex to blame us and not the city. The reason why we finally wrote a letter to the city is because we have been meeting with Bombex and it seemed like it was impossible for Bombex to regulate issues like traffic and noise on their own. And we figure the city should be a partner in that. And I think that we, and I agree that we should work on those specific issues of, um, of, of traffic and noise. I, I am on the board of the David Ruggles Center, you know, and um, studied and worked with that history. I do lots of programming there. We enjoyed a wonderful program at Lydia Mariah Child at the Bomb Mix Center recently. And so I completely support that programming and the power of truth. And I, I, I'm also a, a employee of the Center for New Americans and work with immigrants and um, we're familiar, familiar with um, trying to make our, our community more equitable and I'm fully dedicated to that mission. That's not the same as, as saying, well, perhaps while the building is not able to handle lots of loud amplified music, why can't we have that loud programming be at the Drake? Laudable does most of the production and I know they have music at the Drake and at other venues. Why not have the louder music 
program somewhere else and the quieter, more acoustic music at the Bombay Center. You know, there are ways we can move forward that I think can work out well um, to make a more, to come up with a solution. But, you know, the the idea of a pastor saying, we're the bullies when she's kind of bullying us is, is me, is just very upsetting because I truly like, like what Bombay does I, they were wonderful at the uh, Lydia Mara Childs event and at the Power of Truth event. And, um, and you know, I think it's great that they support the Young at Heart Chorus and other um, groups locally. So it's not a matter of not supporting Bombex and that framing is just not helpful and it's disingenuous. And I really believe that, you know, maybe the result of this hearing is that um, we can push forward and figure out what makes sense for what is largely a residential neighborhood. The Florence Community Center um, has multiple businesses in there, but it's not loud. The arts and industry is huge. It's not loud, okay? I hear the Florence Civic Center one night a week um, during the summer. That's one night a week for a few months. Obviously we have sound and, and we have to deal with it. It's not like we can't deal with change, but we also need to be reasonable. Nobody's calling the people with JJ's like, horrible people because they want their community to be reasonably quiet. Thank you. So, so I um, really hope that as a result of this meeting that we can work together and please stop the, uh, the vilification of a group of people and blaming us. Isn't it the job of the city Stephanie, to also support regul and make regulations? Yes, it is. Of course it is. So we are not dictating what, what is happening. Um, and we are not Thank dictating you, the Stephanie, rules. Anyway, I, I, it's hard to talk because it is really it's very sad to hear a pastor demonize us so, so gravely. Thank you, Stephanie. That's the time. Um, Diana Riddle. Hi, I'm a neighbor on Pine Street, and uh, um, I I am supportive of, of Bombex, and I, of course, I've noticed the traffic, but it's not a problem. Um, I really, I'm glad that you've worked out something with the with the parking next to the building in the school building. That that was a really hostile sign of the stop, no traffic in the parking lot was a really unpleasant atmosphere to have in the neighborhood. Um, and I really appreciate this opportunity to, for everybody to talk to each other about what's going on. Um, I appreciate the diverse programs at. Uh, Bombex, and I hear music and noise from all over the neighborhood, from Look Park, and uh, people have parties around in different neighborhoods, in different houses around here, and it's just part of why I, I don't like the leaf blowers much, but other than that, I don't have a problem with the noises. Um, and I, as people are talking, the energy of the discussions really matters, I think, and um, calling in authorities to deal with the problems, I think, is another aspect of something that makes it not comfortable. You know, if if you're going to call in the city to deal with a, an issue, that's it, it seems like there are better ways to work through issues. And, I, and I'm new to the problem, so I, I hear that you've been trying other things, but it, it just seems like having a discussion and trying to work out solutions and maybe fundraising to get more people to be able to deal with traffic issues is something that would be good. Um, that's all I have to say, thanks. Robert? Yes, hi, thanks for the opportunity to speak to um, you and the board and uh, the guys and the residents today. Robert, can I have your last name, please, for the oh, Sure, sorry about that. Um, Ether, E-T-H-I-E-R. Thank you. Uh, and I'm a, I'm a neighbor on Pine Street. I can uh, literally throw a rock from my backyard into the um, yard behind Bombix. And, uh, you know, I guess my observation would be just being on Pine Street doesn't mean um, you have the same experiences as the folks who live immediately adjacent to the facility. The... Um, uh, you know, if, if you're at all likening it to hearing Look Park, which I can also hear, then that means that you are quite a distance away. Uh, it sounds very much like you're at the Green River Festival um, when you're sitting on my back porch when there's a show at Bombix. 
outside. It's remarkably loud. It's, you know, I use a decibel meter and it's, it's over 80 decibels, which seems uh, excessive to me. It's uh, not really possible to enjoy my backyard when there's a show going on. So, you know, and I guess I keep thinking of the, the newspaper article about a week ago where uh, the director of Bombic said only four and a half percent of our uh, shows uh, are, or our programming is problematic. Well, that seems like an easy problem to solve, right? No, nobody here is talking about the 95% of the programming that uh, goes on. That is not something that we need to worry about. It's really what seems like a small percentage of their programming that is causing 100% of the problem. So uh, as neighbors, we just think it's reasonable to take a look at that that's disrupting the neighborhood in the same way that JJ's has been evaluated. Uh, we certainly want that other 95% of the programming to continue. And it's just the, the programming that is disruptive to the neighborhood that seems like it ought to be addressed. So thanks for the, uh, thanks for the time and the opportunity. Carrie Cooper. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you. Sorry, I'm, I'm Carrie Cuthbert, and I'm also one of the close neighbors. I'm actually calling in um, from uh, New York, where we just dropped our child off at the airport. Um, so I apologize for being late. I don't know what, uh, what has been said, but I do want to say um, that uh, we live right next door to Bombix. Um, and when they first moved in, you know, we very much uh, welcomed them. We we're thrilled to have um, an organization like them with a um, you know, focus on arts and equity come into the neighborhood. Um, at the same time, we did raise concerns with the city well over a year ago because of the noise levels as everyone else has discussed and we asked the city at that time to take some proactive steps to put some reasonable restrictions on the small as bob said sort of narrow dimension of their programming that has caused such disruption to our homes the, the city chose not to do so at that point and we've been working with bombix in good faith since then to try to make um, some informal agreements with them but, um, and to be fair, they have made some adjustments, but nothing that has made it possible for us to actually use our homes when they have um, loud amplified shows inside. We, even with windows closed, we can hear them throughout our homes. We actually um, look at their calendar to determine if and when we have people over in the evening. Um, if they have an outdoor event, we know we can't use our property basically at all because it's so loud. So what we're asking for is, um, you know, we want to see Bombix succeed. We want to see them um, be able to provide the arts and cultural um, events that they, they offer to the community. But we want them to be good neighbors. We want them to adhere to the same noise um, limits that the rest of us in the neighborhood have to. Um, whether that means, you know, adjustments to the structure of the building, adjustments to the hours, adjustments to the, the volume of their shows, whatever that is. Um, that's what we want to see. We want to be able to use, we want to find a compromise here that will allow them to use that space and will let us to use our, you know, allow us to, to use our homes as well. And um, we've tried really for a long time to work with them the problems are persisting, which is why we are asking the city to enforce existing regulations and to make some modest modifications to their entertainment license. Um, and we hope we can just move on, you know, from there. Um, I'm just going to pass it over to my husband, Scott, who's also in the car with me for our last few minutes, because I'm sure there's lots more that we could say. My name is Scott Laidlaw. I also live right next door to Bombix. We learned about Bombix's ex existence through very loud concerts that were lasting until after 11 p.m. sometimes and included people hanging out in the street late and the bell ringing sometimes. Um, but when we finally learned that it was a new nonprofit organization with a social mission that we could totally get behind, we gave them the benefit of doubt. Wanting to be good neighbors, we reached out to ask to meet with them. It took quite some time to get a response, but we were eventually able to meet with them. And at the encouragement of our city councilors, we uh, undertook a series of meetings with them on the theory that being good neighbors 
and initiating conversation was a much better way to go about figuring out a way to work together in a way that was both respectful of the neighborhood and allowed Bombex to do what it was trying to do, which again, we have supported. Um, here we are over a year later, we've had difficulty with our meetings. We've had to initiate almost every single meeting. I think the only meeting that we did not initiate was the one directly following the meeting, the hearing in which Carrie and I supported uh, Bombix's application entertainment for an entertainment license. Um, I wanna get that noted that we have done that. We've also offered to help them with grant writing and other things. We're trying very hard to be good neighbors. At the end of the day, we are here now because we are asking Bombix to be good neighbors and the outcomes that we've seen, while there have been some improvements, um, they are not enough. We are still having enormous noise. We in our house can hear uh, performances all the time throughout our house with the windows closed, even, and I'm talking indoor performance of theirs. They have concerts, but they also have rehearsals and other events that are allowed. We had a stretch of nine nights at the end of March, eight of which we heard events at Bombix in our house with windows closed. This makes it hard to actually come home from work and relax. It's not a minor thing, it is a very major thing. And I would invite people who are thinking that we're being petty in some way uh, to consider how would you feel having a concert venue next to your house with no control over the schedule, no control over how frequently noise mm -hmm. came into your house. Uh, this is where we're at. It is really uh, upsetting to us that this happens. And we feel like it's entirely reasonable for there to be some limits. Again, we have worked in good faith, as in good faith as possible with Bombix, um, but we, we haven't gotten results that really matter. And so that is why we're coming to the city to ask for some common sense limits. Uh, sound transmission through the building uh, is pretty high. It's a wood building. We Thanks, live in a wood building. Most of the people in the neighborhood live in wood buildings. Are, is my time up? I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank okay, you. thank you very you much. We appreciate it. We look forward to continuing to work with Bombix. And with the city, we look forward to some, some really good solutions. So thank you all for your time. Connor Stedman. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Thanks very much for the chance to say a few words. I am a Bombex neighbor on Corticelli Street. I live about two and a half buildings away on a diagonal. Um, and I just wanted to say a few brief things. Um, I think that Bombex is a huge asset to the community. I'm really glad they're there. Um, I'm aware that I'm not an immediately adjoining neighbor and that my experience may be different from those who are the immediate next door neighbors. Um, previous to living on Corticelli, I lived in Leeds next to Look Park. Um, my experience living next to Look Park was that it was much louder than my experience living two, two and a half houses away from Bombex. Um, and also I think there's, for in my experience of the, in my experience of the venue and the neighborhood, um, you know, to me, people coming to the venue is just part of what it means to have places where public events happen. Um, you know, I experience this part of Florence as, I'm not sure what the zoning is, but I experience it as a mixed use neighborhood already with, restaurants and arts and industry building and a lot of a lot of businesses and organizations making use of those spaces. Um, and I guess the last thing I'd love to say is that, um, you know, I, I, I just echo what people have said about the Bombex's mission being a really significant one for Northampton and for this neighborhood and community here. Um, and it would be wonderful if whatever solution is developed didn't have to be just a yes or a no, kind of yes without limits or no, you can't operate at all, but that there's some way that can enable Bombex to be there for the long term, because I think they're doing something very important for our city. Thank you. Okay, Natasha, that looks like everyone. Okay. 
Um, who is here from Bombix to participate in the hearing? Okay, great, you're back, thank you. Um, I just wanna start, I appreciate all of the, the words, the sentiments that we've heard from everybody who came to speak. Um, I want to point out a couple of things. One is we have been the recipient of complaints around noise. Um, I have talked with neighbors regarding complaints around noise. And everybody should understand that at no point in time did any neighbor vilify Bombix, ask that Bombix be shut down, or um, or be or say anything in in some manner that was adversarial. Quite frankly, it's been very chill <laughs> communicating with these people. Um, I, I think it's very important to say that. Something else that I want to say is um, it was said early on, and I'm not sure who said it during public comment, but they talked about the economic harm due to the shutdown. And then there were several comments after that that talked about the shutdown being caused by the neighbors calling in a noise complaint to the fire department. That's patently untrue. The shutdown happened because it was discovered one way or the other. If it was because of noise complaints, I don't know, but it was discovered by the building department and the fire department that the facility was being used far beyond the extent that anybody expected. Um, Jonathan Flagg of the building department was, was quoted in Mass Live as saying that Bombix has been operating larger events than what was, had been previously discussed with the building department. So I point this out because this conversation has to be has to be void of any adversarial um, words. Otherwise, we're not ever going to get to any place of agreement because everybody wants Bombix there, including this commission. We want Bombix there. But that doesn't change the fact that this is a, a building that was built in 1830 that is now a um, a place that does awesome things. It does all the things that have been happening there for decades between the faith organizations and the preschool, but it also has um, artist openings, workshops, poetry, sound baths, dances, all sorts of great things, but it also has professionally produced concerts. That is the issue that we need to address is the sound. Parking is a little tricky for this commission because we are not the traffic and parking commission. I do wanna talk about parking a little bit. Um, during the course of our conversation. Um, but I, I also wanna make it clear that there's not a whole heck of a lot we can do where parking is concerned. So the, the bulk of what I would like to focus on is um, uh, the letter that was submitted today by Bombix, which I appreciate, thank you, and um, your plans for sound mitigation. So before we jump in, I just would like to invite Jennifer and Helen to um, make any comments if you have them. Or not, that's fine too. <laughs> um, I would realize I was muted um, talking to myself. Um, <laughs> I also want to thank everyone for coming and speaking. Um, and I think I want to echo some of what Natasha said. I mean, I, I, I guess I too am a little shaken up and upset about some of the rhetoric that was thrown out early in the the, the public comments. Um, and I, I think the word NIMBY or the acronym does not belong here. I almost feel like it, these neighbors who have spoken up had an undue burden placed on them, um, partially from us. Um, because I do, you know, I went back and I, you know, I watched when we approved the entertainment license and it is accurate that neighbors came and spoke, these same neighbors spoke in support of that entertainment license. Um, even though I know that they had previously spoken to the city and had spoken to Bombix about this ongoing issue with the noise, which is real. It's real when you are directly adjacent. You know, no one can deny, there's no reason for any of them to be inventing this. Um, so it has had an impact on the neighborhood, but from the very beginning, everything I've ever heard from the neighbors is we 100% support Bombix, we 100% support their mission. So I appreciate someone said, let's not make this about, you know, like for Bombix or against Bombix. It's clear that nobody is against Bombix. We are all for Bombix. 
And I think we are just looking at, um, you know, uh, being reasonable uh, just because the mission is fantastic doesn't mean that we can ignore the impact on the neighborhood. And clearly there is an impact on the neighborhood. And what I wanted to say is uh, there's this un undue burden in some way on the neighbors that maybe we put on them as well is because even in those discussions, when we talked about the entertainment license, we said the only way we're going to know if there are issues is if the neighbors tell us and, and let us know, because we're not going to be there. We're not going to be babysitting. We're not going to be out there monitoring. We're not sending anyone to monitor. You know, and we also talked to Bombix about making these good faith efforts, which at the time they said, we are 100% in support of that. There is no reason that we wouldn't want to work with the neighbors. Why would we not want to work with the neighbors? So, so anyway, so it's come to this point where the neighbors did finally write a letter. Um, and I think exactly what they were concerned. And, and they also said, we don't want to be those people. We don't want to be enforcing and policing. Um, and so when they did finally write this letter, um, we all know what happened. And now, directly or indirectly, um, as a result of the letter, but I too, as Natasha, like placing blame on the neighbors is not going to do anyone any favors. It wasn't, you know, they didn't say to anyone, come and shut Bombix down. They were just reporting these issues that have been going on for over a year and that they've been trying to get addressed for over a year. So, Anyway, I've been a concern previous to this, just, you know, hearing on the radio. I mean, there's been so much media attention to this um, and just the term NIMBY coming up and, and placing this blame on the neighbors. I, I think it needs to stop. So anyway, that doesn't, I don't know if that helps move us forward, but I just felt like I needed to express that. Um, and, and my point being that this, I think, was what the neighbors were concerned about coming forward and then having this kind of reaction to them. So I appreciate that all those neighbors actually spoke up today. I think it's very brave of you, honestly, because there's been, you know, a lot of vilification as we witnessed all here today, um, and it continues. So, so I would like that that part of the conversation to to not be part of the conversation. I think we are right now need to stay in our lane, and we are looking at, you know, um, whether this entertainment license as it stands, um, you know, if if there's issues that can be resolved around parking. Um, and noise, and and what can we do? It's difficult for us as well um, to help mitigate some of those issues. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Helen and Natasha. I just wanted to, to thank everybody for coming and for speaking up tonight. I appreciate everyone's thoughtfulness, and I do recognize that everyone's coming from a, a space of, of concern and respect, and and I just want to state um, out loud, I know that we're all thinking this, that uh, we all support Bombex, but we do have to recognize the unique situation of having this entertainment venue in a residential neighborhood. You know, many times during conversations, you know, people um, have compared this to the Drake and to the Academy of Music. And well, just imagine if that place was next door to your house. You know, it's just um, so I think the city leaders, including this commission, that we do have a responsibility to look at this, you know, through sort of a, a special cap that it, this is a unique situation. So I appreciate all of you and thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so I think Cassandra and Kyle, I'd like to start with the letter that you, you submitted some materials today. You submitted a, a letter to the commission sort of recapping all of the things. And thank you for that. And you also submitted um, the slide deck from the April 17th meeting that you had with the neighbors, which I attended. The neighbors had asked me to come to this meeting. I didn't participate. It was really just sort of observe and, and hear the concerns and hear what Bombix was up to and all that sort of stuff. Um, in the letter, there's a couple things that I do want to um, bring up. One is there is an email included in the body of the letter you submitted that was sent to Annie by the building department regarding the decibel count that was done on May 27th. So for that, um, we did have the building department, they were signed up to do two visits for decibel counts. One of them was meant to happen 
when you had an indoor performance and one of them by design was scheduled for an outdoor performance, which is why he was there for May 27th. We did not know that the concert had been moved inside. Um, so it was a little bit of a, a waste of time for that visit, but I'm wondering, was this email sent to you? Because this um, sound gathering was part of the overall, um, I don't want to use, a, for lack of a better word, investigation into sort of getting all of the facts and data that we need to try and make some decisions moving forward. So could you tell me how you got this email? Yes. So Kaishlin, who spoke earlier in the meeting, actually um, received uh, Jonathan when he was here to take that measurement so that I, I knew that he had come. I reached out to Jonathan Flagg in the building department and also to Jonathan Frey because I knew that that visit had taken place. And you know, from the conversation I had with Kaishlin, I had some understanding of what the reading had been, but I wanted to follow up to get the actual data that was collected during that visit. Okay. Um, I also wanna correct the record um, just to state that when um, Mark Curtin visited, he said that the fire department was visiting because of a noise complaint. That same statement is reiterated in the letter that I received from Fire Chief John Davin that their visit came directly from a noise complaint from me. Okay, that's fine. And the the reason you were shut down though wasn't because of the noise complaint. It was because of fire safety based on the capacity that to which you were using the building. So they're exactly. separate things. I'm trying very much to not conflate these things because it creates a narrative that's inaccurate. And um, and we need we can only deal with fact. Absolutely. We're but, talking but about this. Yeah. So we're, right. We're we're data and fact based where this Absolutely. is concerned, and that is going to drive our decisions. So to that end, in this email that Jonathan Fry sent regarding. Um, the decibel count, the night that you had this concert was May 27th. So that was two days, I think, after the, the shutdown was rescinded, the season you were allowed to reopen. So this was a crappy time for you guys. I get it. Um, there was a lot of confusion probably amongst ticket holders, whether or not you were still open. There might've been some confusion if it was a safe environment based on the reason you were shut down, all of those things. So that concert, in my view, was not representative of a normal night for you. So we will have two more decibel counts done at a point in time, they will be done blindly um, because I want the data. And I don't care what the data says. I wanna be really clear about that. The data can say that you're fine, great. Then you're within the decibels of what's allowed. The data can say that you're not fine. That is also great because that gives you a benchmark that the city has established for you to use moving forward in terms of sound mitigation. So when I say we are going to have um, a larger sample done of data collecting, that is the reason why. I'm not um, hoping to catch something so that we get you for being loud. That's not what this is about. This is about collecting actual factual data that can help everybody uh, moving forward with efforts and that need to be made. be clear, we welcome that. We have been self-monitoring. Yeah. To ensure that we are in fact compliant. Yep. I realize yeah. that standard is not something that makes everyone in the neighborhood happy, but we we are, you know, we are invested in complying with the ordinance and have been taking steps and making substantial investments of time and resources to do that. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's from from Dave, from the very first time we spoke to you, there's been a lot of conversation about sound mitigation, and you've you've never said you're not interested in doing that. Um at this point in time, we need to turn those that conversation into action. So we're going to figure out how to what what is required to make that happen. Yes, it's unfortunate that is it's this is coinciding at the same time that you're being required to bring the building up into to safety codes. But that that's just the the I think one of the commenters said it, and I can't even remember in reference to what. But this is the cost of doing business. This is just you know the cost of you know there's going to have to be some safety compliances to meet the building and fire department. There's going to have to be some sound mitigation to make this an appropriate building for all of your activities. Okay. Yes. Um, and obviously, based on the information that we shared at the May, not May, April 17th yep. meeting, we definitely have those projects in the pipeline. Yep. And we we we're, we have we're definitely going to ask you about that. Um, back to the to to that meeting, I was I have to say I was very struck by how you described 
um, interacting with the neighbors in terms of scheduling the quarterly meetings. So in your letter, you said that the, uh, that the neighbors refused to schedule the meetings and that they wanted you to do a doodle poll and that, you know, you talked a little bit about it being that you never anticipated being the sole responsible party for scheduling meetings. And I understand that it's a, it's a, it should be a shared burden amongst all of you, but what I witnessed at that meeting, I was the first person to arrive, which felt a little awkward sitting in that beautiful sanctuary. Um, so I had, but I had the opportunity to watch neighbors come in and I saw you all hugging. There was a lot of um, camaraderie and uh, friendship, fellowship happening in that room that I was surprised by. I, was, I didn't really expect that. Um, one of the first things that the neighbors asked for was to get some, some meetings scheduled because I think part of the problem with the scheduling is life. You're all busy. Um, and maybe the idea was if you had meetings scheduled in advance that that would just moving forward, you, it's one less thing to think about is the scheduling of the meeting. So they asked for the meetings to be scheduled and actually Kyle, it was you who offered to do the doodle poll. They didn't ask for that. Um, you offered and, and comments from neighbors were, oh, that's a great idea. And I thought to myself, I was like, gosh, isn't that efficient? Like, let's just put this all to doodle poll. So what's represented in your letter is kind of the opposite of what actually occurred. And I'm a little concerned about that. Um, because I was there to witness it. So I, I, it, it sort of, to me, gives me some concern about this, uh, a narrative that's being put out there that the neighbors are kind of creating this um, adversarial climate. So I don't know if you want to speak to that. Well, well I, you know, I, I guess I'm a little confused um, about uh, facts and data versus narrative, but I think that like we have two letters from the neighbors, which are a narrative, and they're very strongly worded. Um, and actually, a lot of what's been discussed on the call tonight is, does not actually reflect what the content of those letters are. And so we're trying to respond to these things. It's difficult to schedule a whole bunch of people. In fact, the, that last meeting which you attended, um, which was bumped several times to accommodate scheduling yep. changes, and like. Yep. It seems completely immaterial here to be nitpicking about that, but like several neighbors weren't even at that meeting because it's it's difficult to schedule. So we did we do a great job scheduling it? Absolutely not. Is it difficult to schedule and get everybody in the room? I mean, there's even things that there's a lot of data that came out of that meeting that is not reflected in the conversation that's happening today. So right. what what my what and maybe I'm not uh, making my point clearly enough. Yes, I totally get it. It's absolutely hard to herd cats. I mean, everybody works, everybody has lives and scheduling these meetings is tough because you're trying to accommodate a, you know, a good portion of the stakeholders and those are all of the people in your immediate community on that street. You offered to do the doodle poll. What this letter says is that the neighbors refused to schedule and that they preferred you to send out the doodle poll. And that's not what happens. Well, so I, you know, it's just not you, what happens. Okay, the, the way that actually we remember that, if this is what we're talking about, is, is that we had it on the agenda to, to pick the next meeting time at the top of the agenda to circumvent this happening again. So that's why it's in the, in the agenda on the slide deck that you have in your hands. And that the group decided that we couldn't do it at that time. So thus the solution was to send out a doodle poll, right? But because there weren't enough people in the room and it was too complicated for everybody to look at those schedules. But we had that at the top of the agenda as you know, because that felt important. It's definitely not my recollection of how that went down. And I I, I felt it, I, and the, what is most important to me to bring it up is because of kind of how the neighbors have just been treated in the in the public comment and really vilified. And I, I want to bring all of this back to, um, back to facts and things that actually happened. I, I'm not at all negating the fact that it is extremely difficult to schedule these meetings. And I also don't think that the onus should be on you solely to schedule these meetings. I think that there should be some way to find a shared responsibility. When we approved this license back in October of 22, it was because these meetings were already well underway. When this license came, became our responsibility after the mayor's office was working on it, those meetings were already well underway. It is such an important part of this whole process. So 
you know, I, I think that it's also important to understand, like, we, we don't want to vilify anybody, but it's also hard to not sit in our seats and feel a little vilified as well. Because, for example, you were at that meeting mm -hmm. and you were, you know, part of that discussion. And most of what was discussed is not actually reflected in the letters that were written to the city. Just as an example, as of June 1st, we have now resumed a parking arrangement with the parking lot next door, which was in place for the first year. And the neighbors applauded that as, as being a really effective thing when we would actually yep. put out signs on the street asking the public not to park there, even though they could legally, and instead put them in that lot. At the meeting, we discussed the fact that they were asking us for $25,000 a year. Yep. We were in negotiation and, and working towards that. And I think if you read those letters, like you, you will find that, that that process and what was communicated is not reflected. So it's also like we're we're trying to understand, like, how can we have meetings that are productive where where the efforts that we are making are are reflected because i know that like if i could snap a finger and have this building be completely sound isolated we absolutely of would of course you would but yeah. um it's it's so it's you know i think that if if we're gonna get into that territory i think we kind of need to look at like what's you know, clearly we're both both sides of the equation here are having a little bit of a different experience and there's a lot of information coming through that we could sit down and look at all the letters that have come through but you know it's like I, I'll, I'll turn it back to you to figure out you know how you want to navigate this but yeah well I think um I think if Jennifer and Helen agree it would make sense to start with some hearing about the efforts towards sound mitigation seeing as that is the I agree with that, that. Sure. yes so um and this is all what was shared you know during our last neighbor meeting um we just completed putting an air conditioning in the building um which was a substantial investment which allows us to keep the windows closed at all times that's a step it's an important step and it's an expensive one and that that is now done this building fully is fully air conditioned for the first time in its history and this uh, is the whole new hvac system that you were talking about yep. the whole heating and cooling system Yes, yeah. and that's all of our spaces, not just the sanctuary space that's air conditioned. Okay. So, and I believe when we had that meeting, we described that as being a, a project that was just beginning. Um, we also uh, described the next project in the sequence of things that we're we're working on for sound mitigation, which is um, creating a, a new uh, envelope of insulation around the entire sanctuary. I think we talked about it at length during that meeting. Um, and shared some details about that. That is now uh, that project is just about to get underway, um, and you know is again a substantial investment that has been funded and and is lined up. And I think the work is scheduled to start within the next couple of weeks on that. Yeah, actually, that that work should be starting at the end of June, and we hope to have that completed this summer. We're in and our final contract steps with Mass Save. Okay, and you have contracted with a an, an installer for the installation, or that's still in the works? No, we have a contractor who's been working on the project since January. So you, okay, I, I, okay. Do you know who's going to be doing the installation? The Alpha. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and they've been part of this now months long process of evaluating the building several times, looking at the different spaces, and there have been several reports that have been prepared as part of this process that then get shared with Mass Save and then go to um, Eversource, who's our energy provider. So it's a multi step process, but we have been diligently moving forward with that. Right. And so the primarily what the, the new HVAC system and insulation are going to be most successful in our efficiencies and comfort and being able to keep the windows closed during events. Getting the sound transmission from the sanctuary to the neighborhood. So do can you talk a little bit about what conversations have happened, have taken place with your contractor for the insulation where Part of the project it has an end game of providing some mitigation as opposed to just being insulation for this really old building that had no insulation so it's going to become incredibly insulated but talk us through how that will impact sound mitigation and what who you've talked to about that 
we pays and sound mitigation come through and, and look at these plans. The insulation is a, is a two has has multiple goals, right? One is insulation and efficiency in the building. But as that project was shaped, it was designed specifically to put the insulation mass where it's going to make a difference for sound transmission. And that includes specifically um, uh, not only you know dealing with the walls, but it has to do with with dealing with the attic and the ceiling above the church. It has to do with the way that the envelope is created um, beneath in the floor, um, in the stage area. So there, there's a, a lot of extensive work has been done, and we can share you know more uh, information from from some of the consultants who have been through here. But that project has been tailored to you know really address that as a sound mitigation as an objective. Yes, we've had Bill Ryan come and do an evaluation and um, material from his evaluation was available at the April 17th meeting. We also had Silent Sound, Wynn from Silent Sound come and you know address some of the internal concerns in the building. And again, that information was available at the April 17th meeting. And then we also have been working with Greenfield Glass to understand the impacts of installing um, windows in around the stained glass windows. And again, that information was also shared at the, so, the April so that's, meeting. That's the, the the windows are like phase three here, right? So we, we've, we've had a specialized solution for these historic stained glass windows designed um, that that I think we shared some of the materials and I'm sure you saw that when, when we had that meeting, but that's been specifically designed um, to, to mitigate the, the sound that goes to the windows, which are of course, you know, a major, major area where sound, you know, escapes the building. Mm -hmm. So phase one is the HVAC installation. Phase two is the further sound mitigation. Phase three is the window sound mitigation. Is that correct? Yes. And are any of the people who you've consulted with in this um, effort for sound mitigation, have any of them been involved in the work that was done at 33 Holly or at the Academy of Music? No, but um, Bill Ryan has worked with Treehouse Brewing it, and several other performance are, venues. Are, are, you, are you concerned about the qualifications of the people who have consulted? Um, or? No, it's not that. It's, it's because it's kind of, we have obvious uh, resources in terms of um, identifying contractors and consultants. So 33 Holly Street, for example, is a, I think a great example of sound mitigation. The reason they did it was because they're in a neighborhood and they, they've got train tracks right next to them, but still they fully mitigated the sound of that building so that they could do all of these activities. Um, so that's an easy resource in terms of figuring out the who's and the how's and the fundraising. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure about that because um, uh, new construction and 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 the opportunities they have for construction are very different than they are in a historic building. Um, you know, one of the options, for example, is to peel this building apart and essentially rebuild it from the inside out, um, which which would violate the historic preservation. So it's 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 not actually a, a you know an analog. These two buildings are very different, and the challenges are very different. Um, but the, the contractors aren't likely very different. I understand you're working with totally. I mean, I my work is in is in buildings, so I get that your work you've got two completely different animals, and it's not a fair comparison in terms of how to or what needs to be done or what has been done. I get that. It's a resource. Is mm -hmm. I think if you really want to that contact information? We'd be happy to get comparative quotes. I mean, it might be helpful to extend the circle of your outreach for this. And again, you know, we've, I know you're thinking about sound mitigation. I know you're moving towards sound mitigation, but it's, it's, it is the one problem that we as a license commission have to deal with. So um, it has to come to the forefront. It has to be happening faster in order to, to be able to continue. And I, the way I sort of envision like this awesome machine that you are is, you've come along and you're doing all of these incredible things and it's the wheels are going faster and faster and it's picking up and there's more interest and there's more community support and there's more ticket sales and there's more all of these things and funding and grants and amazing stuff happening but on the outskirts the the infrastructure to support it so that it has the most um, greatest opportunity to last there forever is not happening at the pace as your growth 
Yeah. I would actually contradict you because it is in fact that high, high profile programming that enables us to leverage those grant funds. Exactly. You know, no, it's not I said. Then I can't, you know, I'm not in the same place to raise that kind of money. And okay. we are doing a lot of internal work. We have okay. been supporting the floor in the building, which is addressing another set of safety concerns. We are the recipient of a nonprofit security grant. And that's addressing another set of security concerns in the building. Like, while this specific project has taken a little longer because our work with Mass Save has now taken several months longer than we anticipated, I just want to point out that we have been addressing, you know, like this is an old building with decades of deferred maintenance. Our number one priority is to bring it up to code. And we've been in conversation with the building department and the planning department and you in licensing, trying to make all of these things run on parallel tracks. And, and we, we um, you know, phase two is funded. Phase one is complete. Yes. Phase three needs to be funded. It's a substantial, incredibly compromised in our funding capacity because we have a $300,000 sprinkler installation that has to happen and has to come first. So um, it, it puts us in, in a whole different category of trying to ramp up and, and do fundraising um, while we also have significant revenue loss, um, continuing revenue loss um, associated with that. So, you know, we, there's no way, for example, that we can, you know, look at a calendar and commit to phase three of this project right now because we have a, a huge mountain to climb. And, and all the community support, which is wonderful, um, you know, I, I, I hope that gets us a long ways down, down the road on the sprinkler project, but it's, uh, you know, it's going to be a substantial investment. No, it definitely will be. Um, Helen and Jennifer, do you have questions, comments? Um, yes, this is a complicated situation, obviously, because, you know, and I, I totally uh, understand your point about, you know, the bigger shows are what are helping you then support your mission and and get the funding to bring in the sound mitigation. Um, uh, this is going to sound like a completely ignorant question. Can you turn down the sound? I mean, this is, I'm, I'm really, I'm not being facetious. No, like, no, no, like, no. like with, no. with these larger concerts, is, is there a way to, knowing that we don't have the sound mitigation in place, knowing that you've, it's physically impossible to have that in place at this time, um, is there anything you can do internally to, to make it less loud, you know, for, for these concerts? I, I think that's a really good question, and that's one that's come up several times at neighbor meetings. And, and I think the answer to that is, is unfortunately, it's not as simple as we would all like. Um, I guess I, I want to point out a couple of things um, related to noise. One is that we've had one outdoor show, which was unamplified in the last 20 months. Okay, so there's a lot of conversation today about the disruption of outdoor shows. And um, we didn't do any last summer um you know because we were trying to work on all these issues that we didn't have air conditioning and you know so that anyway that's that's that seems to be clouding this picture so i'm just putting that can aside we have, yeah. just yes sorry i don't want to interrupt just a quick question for the outdoor stuff you've had one outdoor show that was the brass band right yep. and then what have you had outdoor private events that are weddings bar mitzvahs We've had one outdoor private event, which was the ILI fundraiser, and the portion that was outside was a cocktail hour. Okay. So it wasn't it wasn't a concert. It wasn't even speakers. It was just you know background music and socializing. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Um, and there's there's three outdoor concerts planned for the summer, which are like the Neilds and uh, you know the not they're not rock bands. Um, anyway. Um, so going back to the question about turning it down, you know, there's, I think we should all get on the same page about what a big concert is because people look at big names, right? Um, and, and a big concert could be a big name that packs this place. Um, but the reality is, uh, A, I think it's important to understand that like when we have a sold out concert here, we may be making zero dollars, you know, other than like the rental for that night. Bombix, Bombix doesn't make money on ticket sales and there's a rental, but you know, you, you bring an artist who's a big name artist into a little hall and it's not, it's not an infusion of revenue that that's coming into this picture somewhere. But two is like a, a big show that sells out could be a solo artist with a piano, right? So it's not like noise, noise levels 
sound has nothing to do with with the perception of how big an artist is or how big the audience is because we've had you know completely sold out events here like Rufus, Rufus Wainwright, which are concerts, or the um, Trans Health Benefit, which was a speaking engagement. And those are big to a lot of people, but they're not, but they don't generate any substantial noise levels. I think so really, we're, okay, well. Right, so yeah, yeah, I'm sorry if the terminology was incorrect, but I think no, 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 I'm it's saying a, it's okay. the ones so, that are loud, can they somehow be less loud? And yeah, the ampli the that, amplified uh, events. Yeah. yeah. Amplified this, 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 yeah, this gets into a really uncomfortable territory because th there's because we can't um, edit the the program. We can't we can't just turn somebody down. You can't put a, a a band on the stage and turn them down. And for example, two loud shows that we've had in the past uh, you know couple of months are Sona Jabarte um, and um, uh, Fatimata Diawara, two you know incredible artists from Africa who are you know highly regarded, they have percussion instruments and, and so on. And it's not something that we can just turn a knob and, and, and turn it down. So if you were to look at the calendar and recognize the shows that would be edited out, the artists that we would have to edit out if we said, okay, we can present classical music, we can present singer songwriters, um, but we're gonna take anything out of here that involves percussion or anything that could be perceived as being loud, um, I, you know, it, it would be a, a really unfortunate and sort of discriminatory looking picture. Um, you know, we're not we're not a rock club. Um, we're not Pearl Street. We're, we're not booking a bunch of rock bands. And, you know, but the world music um, is something that that, you know, would would be on the chopping block. So, I mean, that said, and nobody wants that on the chopping block. I mean, I think that's the world music is something that really sets what you're doing apart from what any other music venue is doing. So how how can you mitigate that faster? I mean, what it's it's it is it's frustrating. It's a little frustrating to hear because it's it is it kind of is what it is, is what you're saying is we can't you can't not have that type of music because then it's discriminating against what type of music you're having. So how do we deal with this? How do we, how can you help us deal with this with some mitigation that can happen sooner than later? Well, the installation is going to happen sooner than later. That's going to take place over the summer. Like that's a project we've been working on for, you know, over eight months to get that in place. And, you know, unfortunately, like that's the process with the contractor and with Mass Save to get that in place. You know, it was my understanding when I began that last year that we would be able to install this spring. There have been multiple delays on their end. So, you know, within a couple of months, there will be a significant reduction in the sound transmission. That is fast. You know, we, we've had several consultants come in and, and look at the proposals that we have for, for in the steps that we're taking and confirm that like these are the right steps to mitigate the sound. Um, you know, uh, and, and, and Mark, who is our architect um, and coordinates a lot of this, um, has his hand raised and maybe he'd like to speak to some of this. Mark Sternick. That would be fine. Hi. Okay, thank you. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say, I mean, the concern here is what can you do as, as quick as possible to mitigate the sound? And one thing I would ask is, can the city move forward as quickly as possible with the sound level monitoring? Because what they've found so far is that the sound does not go over the existing uh, the existing limits. So if they if they find that that's the case in the next couple that they do, then there, you know, there maybe isn't a problem with breaking any of the of the uh, ordinances that already exist. And at least that can be done at the same time that Bombix is working on insulating the walls and getting, you know, getting the place to act less like an actual drum so that it's vibrating and sending the, the sound out 
and we can start um, looking the, at the what we market. can do to the actual windows facing the neighbors. Um, you know, these are things that can all be done uh, at the same time so that through the summer, these things can be taking place as long as you allow Bombix to, um, to keep going. So that's all I have to say at this point. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Jennifer, do you have, what are your thoughts right now? My thoughts is that the timing for this hearing just seems not to be ideal because we just received the, the new lease agreement. So I hope that eases up parking, but I don't want to naively say that will ease up the parking concerns and um, as well as the completion for this insulation project. Um, I, I'm hopeful that is uh, that it will be a significant sound um, insulator, but you know, Natasha, we keep we, we we want the data, right? We want the data, and I don't know what the data on June thirtieth will be or on July thirtieth. So I'm struggling today with this. I'm encouraged that the work's being done, but um, I I just don't have those decibel readings. I don't I don't have that data at that point. Yeah, I mean, we 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 shared a bunch of data, we can share more data, and our data is consistent with the findings that were forwarded to us by the building department too. Um, so there, you know, that that was helpful to us to get that data because it confirms, you know, well, our- I, I do have a lot of data that you've shared. I do have that that April 17th um, slide deck with the decibels and that that is helpful. And, and I, I mean, we also have to weigh people's perceptions. Right. I went to an outdoor event a few weeks ago and, and two folks came up to me. One person said, oh, my gosh, I walked here and I didn't even know this was occurring. You know, the, the noise was so reasonable. And somebody else was like, oh, my God, for Tuesday night, this is out of control. So um, you know, I want the data, but we also have to acknowledge that that the neighbor's perception is real and what they're hearing, you know, those those eight out of nine consecutive nights in March. I mean, it's something that we have to deal with. And, and again, I just wish I knew tonight how that this current ins insulation project will, will help that. Um, also um, in that packet from April 17th, which for some reason I cannot find, but I know I, I combed through it before. Um, uh, there were a couple things I noticed. One was that it seemed it was written in there that it was admitted. Yes, some of these shows are too loud. But, and I don't know, it was just sort of a statement put in the middle of that, which I found interesting. And I didn't know what what that meant. If it was like, yeah, they were too loud and maybe we should have controlled them better. Or uh, I guess you can speak to that, Kyle. I don't know if that was something you had written in the, that packet. No, I think I think that that was us validating the experience of the neighbors. Like, we 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 have never said that. Oh, because we're under the ordinance, it's okay and we're done, right? We we have we have said since the beginning and have been working really hard, not as fast as any of us would like, but working as fast as we can to improve the situation because we we understand quality of life. We understand you know, that everybody in the neighborhood has a different sense too of, of what, what is tolerable and what is not. And we, we would like to be silent. We, we would like to, you know, achieve mitigation. We're, we're talking about all these steps. We're, we're going to be able to measure um, very comprehensively what the attenuation is of each one of these projects, right? And, and what difference it makes along the way. I'm not sure where that gets us in terms of like, we can look at that from a data perspective. And we may or may not then pull into a zone that feels better to a next door neighbor. I, I, you know, but it's it's very hard to say, right? Because there's a very subjective element to this. There's a very scientific element to this. And we can all sit here and we can talk about the hypothesis that everybody has who's consulted on this project about where we'll see reductions and how we'll see those reductions. But you can't marry that with in any definitive way to the conversation about how it feels. To, to people, right? And, you know, similarly, like I know people in the 33 Holly neighborhood who feel like it's loud and that they did a lot, but it's still loud, right? So I, I think I think we could point to any venue 
um, you know, including, for example, there are people on this call talking about, you know, what it's like to live near the VFW, right? It's like, so th this is not, this is not a, a Bombex, you know, only issue. There, there is no building that is, is perfectly silent um, when, when you're presenting music. And, um, you know, there are certainly nights where, um, uh, you know, there, there are artists that we won't have back because we don't, we actually don't, we don't want a, a loud concert in here. You know, but you, you you don't know. You can't book music and say, well, how many decibels are you? Or, um, you know, control how many you know how many ensemble members show up on a stage or or what instruments exactly they play. So, you know, it's it, this conversation sort of has an interesting like I, I feel like we're trying to find the intersection of of like data and and subjective experiences, but it's it's a hard thing to uh, to figure out how 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 that happens in a way that lands so that everybody's happy. Right. Yeah. And I, and I appreciate your recognition of all that. That's true. And I know everyone, I choose to believe it. Everyone is trying to do the right, right thing here. Um, um, and well, anyway, another thing I was going to point out was in that was the indoor sound levels were like 86 decibels. So I assume the outdoor sound levels will be the same. And I think we all need to agree and recognize that those outdoor shows, there's no way, there's no way that you're going to be below the, the levels, but it, from what I'm hearing from neighbors is they are willing to sort of put up with that or hope to enjoy it, you know, for, for it's, it's, it's the amount of the concerts or, or, you know, how many concerts are happening. You know, I think I said it when we were giving you the entertainment license, like if my neighbors wanted to do a bar mitzvah, that's fantastic. Make all the noise you want. I love it. But if you're going to do that three or four times a week, then we're going to have some issues. So, I mean, I think we recognize that. And that when you go outside, there's nothing Let's be honest. There's not there's not much you can do to mitigate that sound. So I think it's then a, a matter of like how many concerts are there going to be? You have now stated that there's going to be three. Although I was confused because in that letter from John Frey, someone stated there will be none. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure if that was a miscommunication. Um, but then also we have an entertainment license that says you can have 30 outdoor events. And I know when we were talking about that, we were talking about those not just being concerts, but they could be weddings, bar mitzvahs, that kind of thing. So I guess one question is, since you've stated it, I, I guess I just want to hear it again. Are, are you saying that there are really only going to be three events, which happen to be concerts that are outside? Is that currently yes. is that the plan? Yeah. So, okay. So we now find ourselves in a, um, so three outdoor events. And when we met with the licensing commission last year, right, we had a conversation that an event is a, ticketed mm -hmm. performance of some kind. So for example, yeah. like ILI holds a fundraiser or if there's a bar mitzvah, that's not an event as divine. I, no, I'm just to interrupt, sorry. I don't know that that's true because I just rewatched it. And I think we, in fact, there was, a. I think you had said you shouldn't distinguish between like you were making the argument a bar mitzvah can be right, just as, loud as a concert. But, in yeah. okay, but, but when we it, talked about events, then I understood it as, any kind of event, any kind of outdoor yeah. event. And yeah, we, we talked about the amplified event music extensively because I was of the position that a concert is different than a bar mitzvah outside because you can tell a DJ to lower the volume. You can't tell a band to do that. So we had a big back and forth about that the last time. Um, but the 30 event, the 30 events were for outdoor events. It wasn't 30 ticketed concerts and then whatever else you want. Mm -hmm. um, but I think to back to Helen's quest, like, so I'm confused based on what somebody told John Fry that there were no further outdoor concerts, that there would be no outdoor concerts. And for, for the record, John Fry said there should be no outdoor concerts, that it should not be allowed because there is no way for uh, sound mitigation to happen. Um, but to Helen's question, you have, you currently have three scheduled for the summer? We have three concerts scheduled for outdoor this summer. And I mean, it's, again, this comes down to an interesting subjective thing. Like the one concert that was outdoors, um, which was when we had been shut down and instead of, you know, turning away these two community groups, we let them perform outside. It was unamplified, but it was a 30 piece brass ensemble and some Tyco drummers. Mm -hmm. Like we, we measured that too. And um, so, you know, we sit here being not sure what we should do 
like with, with the outdoor events, like a lot of people, for example, are reaching out to us and really wanting us to do outdoor events because they're still uncomfortable being inside with COVID or whatever, you know, whatever the thing is, people want to bring their families, they want to have a picnic. Um, and, and we'd really like to be able to offer that as an opportunity, as is offered in many other places in this community. Um, we're really skittish to do that, and which is why we only scheduled three events, because we're sitting here feeling like, wow, somebody's going to be running around with a sound meter, and this is going to cause a whole bunch of trouble. Um, and, you know, and based on this conversation, it's hard to say, like, you know, we can have this concrete thing of understanding what the ordinance is, but I'm not sure that that doesn't still cause us harm if we work within the ordinance, but it's it's to somebody's displeasure. At the same time, you know, there's other standards for other community-based performances that are going on with a lot more frequency than three, you know, three over the summer. So it's 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 hard for us to figure out how to operate and what the right thing is to do. You know, we can disappoint a bunch of people and bring those three concerts inside and try to stay safe from a, a really fuzzy, unclear sort of set of parameters that that we've been given here because we don't want to get into trouble. Or we can try to, you know, maintain and, and and offer that to people who really want to have that outdoor experience, and then we sit back and say, "Geez, I, I, you know, is it like how does it feel for us to be held to different standards than any number of other outdoor performances in the community?" So it, it's just it's a confusing place to be here on the right. side. So and, and just you know just so you know, do. sorry, Kyle, to interrupt, but so you know where I was coming from with that question. I guess what I'm saying is we recognize, I will recognize that it's going to be louder than the decibel level that's a lot loud in that area. I think the neighbors know that too. I think it's for neighbors, I would assume who are right there, it's a, a matter of like knowing how often that's going to happen. I don't think anyone's saying that should never happen, you know, and obviously it does happen in other areas in Florence and, and within Northampton. I think it's a frequency issue and that's what we came to a conclusion with with JJ's where there was quite a bit of back and forth and several hearings about it and then it ends up being oh, sorry frequency and time yeah the, yeah the, so yeah so the length of the length of the show itself and then and also how often I'm also going to state again I hate being in the position of like policing that and saying this is how often you know I mean I wish like you say I wish there was just no sound coming and it wasn't an issue but I think it's a, I guess, a reasonable expectation that you're not going to have, um, as the immediate neighbors said, I can't remember, nine shows in a row or six shows in a row. Sorry if I'm getting the numbers right, like at the end of March. And, and but, yeah. but, but I guess, I guess so. I, I, I was just curious, like, what can people expect? Um, you know, and is it that there's going to be three concerts? I don't think anyone's against having three concerts outside. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, I, I I'm trying to look at the, the the calendar right now, but you know, we um, and I don't know if if that this thing that keeps getting cited of X number of concerts in a row is also counting like I don't know a Young at Heart rehearsal or something, but you know, we we have I, I think we shared with you in the letter how many shows have happened and how many on average that is per week, and we have a limit to how many we can do a year, right? So we've done like on average this year it's been 1.7 something. You know, events events per week. So I just I, I want to be careful about these characterizations, um, or I'm happy to get factual about them. Um, right. I think. To, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, this time that they're citing, as I look at the calendar, you know, most of these things, like we had a solo guitarist, we had a classical music concert in the afternoon, we had, you know, a folk ensemble. Like these are not, you know. These are not blowing anybody's windows out. Like these are exactly the quiet types of programming that the neighbors have requested. Yes, there was a density of programming at that time, but it also averages out over the year because we had almost no programming in December, almost no programming in January, very little programming in February. And, you know, as our year, you know, as our calendar filled up, like it averages out. Our, can I ask you a question about the density? Or Cause I, I, Print, I printed out the calendar and marked when the shows were. And so I see how it progresses as, as the winter, we get farther away from winter, there's more uh, performances, which makes total sense. Can, can you, do you see space to be more mindful of the density? Well, I think the average, you know, with 120 shows 
performances that we can do each year, that is an average of two a week. And we are adhering to that. If you look at the calendar, you know, some of the things are concerts, other things are fundraisers like the ILI fundraiser or- Sorry, what about if, I'll just want to be more specific. What I'm in reference to amplified events. So the poetry readings, art openings, things like that, that are low impact volume wise, I'm not really thinking about in terms of density or, you know, for that matter, the two per week. Um, I'm thinking about when we say there's an average of two per week, yes, there's going to be a month without anything, but that only means it's going to be in another calendar month. And you put it perfectly by referring to it as density. So is there a way, do you see yourselves able to control that at all, the density of the amplified musical events? Well, so, yeah, no, so, but, but this, again, I think this, the, the whole concept of amplified is, is a little bit of a, a, another one of these gray areas, you know, um, you know, like on, on that, on that April week that we're talking about, we had Yasmin Williams, who is an acoustic guitar player. It's technically amplified because she plugs in because nobody would hear her guitar. Right. But she's a solo acoustic guitar player. There's no percussion. There's nothing in that band. And there was a classical concert that day too. So like, we actually do try to manage density and we can't control when artists are available. Um, but we actually do turn some things down because we feel like a week would be too heavy or because um, we feel like, um, you know, a show um, uh, that, you know, we we might be able to have, but only on a weekday is really more appropriate for a weekend. So we, we actually do engage in that kind of selective thought process now. And, and we really make an effort to do that. Um, you know, that's, that, that is part of the curatorial process that exists now. Yep. Um, right. And density perhaps has a greater impact on parking. Right. It's the whole picture of, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot that comes into play, the perception of it, all of it. So it could be an amplified acoustic guitarist, but you've got 300 cars in the neighborhood. So there's that extra. Right. And, now the, right. and with our parking agreement in place, you know, as of a couple of days ago, we're actually able to move those vehicles off the street and decongest Park and Pine. Yeah. Um, a quick question. So when when you were closed, you had to move performances. You moved, I, I think, I don't know if you moved just two performances or if there was more, but some were moved. Summer one was moved to um, St. John's on Elm yep. Street and then others to Race Street in Holyoke. Let's let's yeah, clarify let's... that. Like that, that we didn't move them. So one of one of the renters of Bombix is the Valley Classical Concerts that that presents here. That's yeah. rental revenue for us. That's not our concert. They moved their concert okay. to another church that doesn't have sprinklers. Okay. And, um, and Bombix has to refund that rental. Similarly, when a concert moved to Gateway, that's rental revenue that Bombix has to yeah. refund. When Collider Fest was canceled, and some of that was refactored and moved up to. Um, Hawks and Reed, again, that's rental revenue that we lost. That was rental revenue, not only for that show, but also for the record fair, for the food vendors. Like that was many thousands of dollars. That, of no, it's, that yep. No, we're, we totally get that. Um, when you do rent out any aspect of the building, whether it be the sanctuary or I think what you call the peacock room or the kitchen, anything like that, I assume you have a contract. Yes. The renters. Do you have any language in your contract around the sound and around, like now with our um, entertainment licenses, we have a good neighbor clause. Is there anything like that contained in your contract so that there's communication yes. to your renters? Yes. Because I know you can't always control how loud something is going to be, but if you're renting the space out, you're the host. And I'm curious about what level of responsibility you take and, and convey to these these people. Yeah, we do have a clause in our contract that states that, you know, any renter needs to com be compliant with all city ordinance and we enforce the, our voluntary early stop in that contract. You know, for example, our license uh, permits us to go until 10 on weekdays and until 11 on weekends. And we, when we contract, make sure that our renters stop you know, in alignment with our informal agreement with our neighbors, which is nine o'clock on weekends and weekdays and 10 p.m. on weekends. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, Helen and Jennifer, what more do you? Um, yeah, I'm curious, I'm um, going back to, um, and I do appreciate all these efforts that you've made. Um, and I know none of it is inexpensive um, or in terms of money and energy input. Um, so uh, with the consultants that you've hired for sound mitigation and with this insulation, that's this first phase, which is great that that's coming up. Is there Has there been a statement as to at least, and I know we don't know until it actually happens, but has there been, um, has someone put together a suggestion of like what that will do for sound mitigation? I mean, with these yes. consultants, are they saying like it'll break? I don't know if it's in terms of decibels or if it's in terms of just like vibrations with the walls or what. So what has been said about that? Yeah, can I do you, um, I think this would be a good time to have John Lacido, who's our facilities person, speak yeah. to that. He's actually been the person working directly with, you know, the sound consultants, as well as with the uh, with the folks at B Alpha who will be taking, you know, taking basically doing the insulation work. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd, I'd be interested in that. Hi. Oh, can you unmute your computer? Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so my name's John Lacido. I'm, I've been involved here with Bombix for the last year, helping to bring these um, projects to fruition. I, I, I'm well educated in a lot of trades, so I interface with all the um, contractors that come in. Um, I was the one that just finished up the um, HVAC contract, and I also spoke at the meeting uh, that Natasha was at, uh, about the sound mitigation with everybody. Um, so I brought in a consultant who actually is working in, uh, 10 churches in the Boston area. And also the, uh, Bethany assembly of God, I believe in Agawam, um, and is, a he's a recording studio designer which, you know, if you know about recording studios, what the whole thing is, is that you can't have sound coming in and you can't have sound going out. Uh, but <clears throat> what he shared that I think is very important information is that how different it is to work with an existing building, especially an old existing building, a historic building. It is different than, than what the approach that's taken when you're building a new building. Um, so, but anyway, he did outline uh, some pretty de detailed information about each phase of the project for sound mitigation and our approach to it and the differences that it will make, um, which we can share some of that with you guys if you want. I wasn't sure if that made it into the package or not. No, but we can follow up with that. So we, we will send you his... Um, his um, letter that he wrote for us, which gets into a little more detail about what each phase and how it will affect the sound transmission. Cause he gets into it a little more about the insulation, for instance, um, they're doing blown in insulation, dense pack in the walls. And this place is built with what's called balloon construction. So there actually is a pretty giant void between the wood and the outside wall. So it actually makes a huge difference in not only the sound transmission, but the vibration, which is, which is a thing that affects the neighbors is, is the vibration. Um, it, so think of it like an instrument, it's acting like an instrument. Mm -hmm. It actually is reverberating itself, the actual building, because it's hollow. So it's almost like a gigantic bass drum of sorts. So some of the sound I, I think, and I actually tried to get into conversations with Scott next door about this stuff because he's the best person to talk to um, about his experience. Um, I'm trying to uh, understand what he hears next door, the fre frequency wise, because I believe that this insulation is going to make a difference with like sound that you feel, not just here, if that makes sense. Yeah. Base, base sort of travels a lot more than high end does. Right. Um, 
So that's why we've been pushing to try to get this mass save thing through. It's a lot of red tape um, and a lot of walkthroughs and a lot of, you know, discussions about the best approach. Um, but we kind of, I, I made sure to steer it in a direction where um, it would make the best possible scenario for the sound okay. as far as trying to keep the sound inside and not going out. Thanks, John. Thank okay. You. Um, thank you. So it sounds like um, when we're talking about the frequency of events and with with Scott say, saying, you know, the number of events at the end of March, just so I understand, is the suggestion that they're really hearing everything. I mean, that the, the building is, is such that even when it's not just a show, these rehearsals, I mean, I think that was suggested. It's like things even beyond these shows that you have scheduled are just when you're directly adjacent to the property. Um, those those become loud. Is that, am I misinterpreting that? I mean, which I, I guess, and, and what is the point of me asking that is just that, I mean, it sounds like there's some things that until this mitigation is done just can't be helped. Because we are certainly like that's not even part of the entertainment license, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that it should be that we should be, you know, saying, oh, you can't have rehearsals there either. I think it's just pointing out the unfortunate situation of this building that you're in, and and how close the neighbors are. And yes, Kyle. Um, you know, I, I I can't speak to their experience. I can speak to sound measurement though, and you know, there are ambient noise levels in the neighborhood, right? Of just you know the sounds of the neighborhood and cars and so on. And when we have a classical concert, for example, like we, there's not a measurable difference between when the concert is happening and when it's not, um, you know, same thing with, with, with a folk concert and stuff. So I, I, again, I'm not, I'm not speaking for Scott or, or any of the neighbors in that, but, um, you know, we, we are diligently monitoring and really trying to understand what's going on and looking at the correlations of inside and outside. And, you know, the correlation that's in that slide deck actually shows you that there, there is, um, uh, you know, you're looking at the same show and, and what the decibel levels are inside. And we, we provided data from a loud show in that slide deck to show, you know, a show that we probably didn't want to be as loud as it was just as an experience, you know, in, in the venue, right? Um, and, uh, and, and what was happening outside um, that was still well within the noise ordinance. Um, but as, as I said, with each phase of this project, we get to measure not just from um, not not just using the metrics that are used to measure sound for the noise ordinance, which are a specific set of metrics, but we get to sort of do a full uh, frequency spectrum test to see what what frequencies are escaping and at what levels. And then the project happens, and then we get to see what frequencies have now been contained and what kind of reduction has happened in those specific frequency ranges, right? And at each stage of the project, we get to measure our progress in that way. Mm -hmm. And it looks like um, Scott or Carrie may have their hand raised and I'll put it to the chair, but whether we can call on them. Yes, if Scott or Carrie, yes. Um, hey, everybody. Hello. Um, sorry, we're still driving. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, I wanted to, uh, this is Carrie, and um, I'm just going to pass the phone to Scott, who is driving. <laughs> Actually, she's going to hold. I'm going to hold the phone. Yeah, thank you. Um, just because, John, you, know, you mentioned some questions for Scott, so we were yeah. hoping to just respond. Yeah, John, I thank you for what you're saying, John. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the conversation that we had about the interventions that you're talking about. Um, you had asked me about what I hear, and I think that question was just asked again. I know we had had an email exchange about that. Um, I can hear, it, it depends on the show, of course. You do have shows that are quieter, that feel entirely appropriate and don't bother us, even if we hear them in the house. And then we've got shows that are loud enough to disrupt our use of our house. Our, uh, we, the, the part of the house that is closest to the church is a, an office or den that we I frequently use in the evenings. And that, of course, coincides with rehearsals, uh, with other events, with concerts. Um, 
I can hear the church organ through your wall and window and through my wall and window. They're old houses. We've had Mass Save come out and insulate on two separate occasions because the first time you know, it didn't go quite as well as it could have. There's lots of voids and stuff. And John, that's something you and I had spoken about. I know that's on your mind and I appreciate that as well. Uh, thermal insulation doesn't quite work the same way as sound insulation in that if you, thermal insulation, if you, even if it's done not perfectly, will still have value. Whereas sound insulation, really the, dev the uh, devil's in the details trying to get everything right as John and I and Kyle talked about at the uh, walls and roofs and at the floor and the walls all around the uh, the ducts, the vents that penetrate the floor and the walls. Um, there's lots of different details to worry about. Um, and that's something that I think is worth understanding. It's also probably worth understanding that the windows are going to be the weak spot in the system as happens in any building. And unfortunately the windows at the church are really big. I mean, they're beautiful, but they're also really big. So in terms of sound transmission, that, that doesn't help anybody. Um, I know that the interventions that you've talked about there uh, are pretty robust for a window, uh, for an intervention with a window. That's a difficult thing to address. And uh, I know you talked about different levels there. There's uh, an exterior storm that you could use. And then there's also an interior storm they can use. And I think together, John, you had mentioned that they reached STC 39, uh, which is a sound transmission rating. Um, I, I also think that 39 is about the same level that a uh, like an interior partition wall that is no insulation might have. So I, I don't want to, I, I guess I want to just point out that it's not necessarily bringing it, that that will remain a weak spot. It won't be as efficient as the walls will be in blocking sound. And I think that everybody deserves to know that and that needs to be part of the conversation. I also think, um, Kyle, I know you've got a really robust system for monitoring and we appreciate that and we want to protect it um, because that's useful to you and it's useful to us. What we'd like to see is some pre-test, post-test with an independent observer or tester or something so that we have an apples to apples before and after each of the interventions you're doing so we can really understand what it's accomplishing. Um, and I, I think that's something that we had talked about in emails starting last September, but we never got to, and we would still like to see that happen. And I think that would be good policy and it would uh, address the data um, issue really clearly. Another thing I want to mention really quickly, if I may, is the decibel levels. I know that you um, that the church is now zoned as industrial office, and when that happens, that allows a higher level of um, decibel range than a residential neighborhood. So while we next door are held to 55 decibels over the average of an hour, or average over an hour, um, Bombix is now held to 65 decibels over the course of an hour, which um, is a, a weird discrepancy given that we're still residential right next door and Bombix is still surrounded on three sides by residences. And uh, another thing that is of concern is that the way the code is written is that, uh, is that average over an hour. Uh, you know, anybody who listens to music knows that there are breaks between songs, that there are breaks in, you know, bands take intermission sometimes. And the average over an hour, if it's at 65, um, that might mean that some of the music was spiking over 80 or, I don't know, 90 decibels. And those loud spikes are going to be audible everywhere. There, this church, I believe, will never contain sound that loud. And I know at some point, Cassandra, you had been very clear that you intended to hit the average. And I know at other times, to be fair, Kyle has said that you are trying very hard to keep your levels down, but also that that is not something that you feel like you can do because you can't control the bands. Um, although you have talked about um, selecting which bands, curating the bands that you're 
you're inviting to perform there uh, and something that we've asked to maybe do a little more judiciously for the neighbor's sake and for sound transmission's sake. Uh, so I just wanted to put that out there. Again, I appreciate this conversation. I really appreciate the, uh, the licensing commission and the questions you're asking. And I appreciate having worked with John and Cassandra and Kylan. We hope to continue to work with you. We're still gonna be neighbors after this. And I know it's become contentious. We don't want that. We wanna be able to work together. We do also want some limits that will help all of us uh, be sustainable in the neighborhood. We don't want to feel like we can't stay in our house and we don't want to see our neighborhood just drop in value and have it change under our feet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jennifer and Helen, do either of you have any follow-up questions or comments to what we've just heard or anything this evening? I don't have anything to follow up with. Um, I, I mean, I, I know it's not helpful. I'm just going to say that again, it's just very difficult because I think there's this recognition that this isn't, it's important that you're in the building you're in because of the mission and because of what you're trying to save in that mission. Unfortunately, this building was not designed for, you know, for this kind of sound mitigation. I mean, what I'm hearing again and again is it's very, very difficult to retrofit this to bring the sound levels down to where they are appropriate for a residential neighborhood but it's this whole catch-22 which i you know uh that i think we're all grappling with that in order to achieve the mission that you've set out you know you're saying that the income is coming from um mostly from apparently this four and a half percent <laughs> um is seems to be where all the uh or the majority of the income is coming to, if I understood that correctly. Um, no, the, the, so the, the form, else. yeah, let, let's clarify that. The, the, um, we are in an incredibly precarious position, and um, and and given the new requirements for sprinklers, right, where we we have like it's going to be very hard for us to stay open, and it's not just like we are not just one organization. We're talking about the property. We're talking about everybody that's in this building, right, because. We we are the the engine that is holding this together. So, you know this this building gets sold if we fail. And you know we have one uh, one volunteer executive director um, and some support staff. But you know with with all of the expenses and we've done an incredible amount of work, which is pretty well documented. You know we're moving really quickly by any measure for any project um, and the investments that we have made. Um, you know, we're we're really teetering on the edge of not existing at all. Doing the high profile concerts is not, and I'd say high profile because it has nothing to do with noise, right? That is what creates public recognition and has driven funding. Like the funding that we have gotten to date and the support that we've gotten to date is very much about the cocktail of things that go go on here, right? So we have now um, that 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 less than 5%, which is is the concert activity in terms of like what's actually happening in this building is part of the revenue stream. Um, it actually becomes more important now because now we have lost a whole bunch of rental income over this next year to two years um, because we can't serve any alcohol in the building. And we're not talking about us serving alcohol to make revenue. We're talking about renters getting a one day alcohol permit to have a reception or something, right? So we just we just lobbed off a whole revenue stream that was actually probably more important than the concerts are to keeping this going. And we have to figure out how to make that up already while we have to raise $300,000 to put in sprinklers. Um, and it's not just putting in sprinklers, like we, you know, we there's not a water main in this building that supports this. So, you know, the first expenditure, which is nearly $20,000 is the study about water pressure in the neighborhood and, and to figure out the engineering based on you know, having to dig a trench and, and bring a whole new, you know, water main from the street. So like there's a whole bunch, whole body of work there that that has to happen. But Bombix, you know, it only exists because of the sum of its parts. And if we start taking those away, um, it's it's just not going to exist. It's not, this is not a, a robust organization. This was, you know, uh, a project put together and it's sort of an alchemy of these different things that has brought us this far. Um, 
but you know what choices you make are are going to really you know have an impact on whether or not we can continue forward we're already really challenged to continue forward on this path um given the the change in in priorities um so you know it 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 is a, it is a complex situation and you know I, I can bring a whole bunch of different ex experts in here and we can share data from different experts you know um I know Scott has some experience through his 33 Holly, um, and, and I know experts that would disagree with, you know, the priorities and, and where mitigation is going to happen. So this, you know, we, again, we're in this realm that is very, uh, very fuzzy and hard to talk about at a licensing level, you know, um, and, and I, I know that's hard for you all. Um, and we, we don't want to be contentious um, and, and we're working really hard, but, you know, it, we, we don't, we don't share any sentiment that is about like, um, you know, othering and giving everybody a hard time. Uh, we, we don't want an adversarial relationship. We really want a good relationship with everybody in the neighborhood. Um, but we're, we're working as fast and hard as we can to get there. And at the same time, it is really disappointing to be sitting in our seats, read these letters that actually don't reflect any of the time, money, and, and expense, or even the history where we have addressed some of these issues or had good solutions um it's 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 really disappointing to read those letters um so i, I you know i i'm not quite sure you know I, i'm glad i'm not in your seats <laughs> but um no, I, I can tell you that i mean you know if go ahead no go ahead i'm sorry oh, I, I just like i i wish that i could point to a solution you know other than fast forwarding uh you know six months nine months um, and and I, I don't, you know, I don't know. Scott is sharing skepticism that after we put another three hundred thousand dollars into sound mitigation, that it's not going to be good enough. And I, and I don't know what good enough is, you know. And I don't know how you measure good enough, you know. And um, because good enough is a subjective thing as well. And and different people, as we heard today, like different people have a different sense about what good enough actually is and and what what is appropriate for a neighborhood. But we we are you know, th this, you're not looking at a robust situation here that is going to withstand much more pressure. Um, and then, you know, at that point, like this church gets torn down and becomes condos or, you know, affordable housing or something. I don't know what it would be, but, you know, well, affordable it's housing isn't the worst thing for a community to have. So talk about NIMBYism. Right? No, no, I'm not, I'm not saying it's a bad thing at all. I'm, I'm saying like the church has actually had conversations about this and, and what kinds of what, wh who they could sell to that would align with the mission of the church because they still own this property and would then have to turn around and sell it. I'm, I'm not, I, I'm so, not casting any versions. We actually work in affordable housing too. And, and um, that's, you know. And nothing brings up the NIMBYs and the pitchforks like trying to situate affordable housing in neighborhoods. It is true. Um, <laughs> a, couple, saying that a, work on those projects. a couple questions, um, or not, it's not so much a question. I really feel like we need to revisit the reality around the sprinkler system. That is being required of you, not because of your noise. It's because of the volume and the capacity of people coming to the building. So yes, it sucks that this is an unexpected expenditure. And I don't know, like license commission has total autonomy. We don't inter integrate with other departments or commissions. Sometimes that might be a little bit problematic because we aren't in the know of all of the things, but I just want to reiterate it. Yes, it was a surprise to you that you needed to do that, but the fact that you have to do it is because of the capacity. It's because of the success that you have that. In yeah, but, but it just, just, just to like, if, if we're, if, if the point here is to understand perspectives, we did a code review before we began this project to understand every expenditure we would have to make. And during those code reviews with the building department and with planning, sprinklers were one of many code related investments that were brought up, that were talked about, that, that a timeline was talked about. So there's a whole nother narrative. I don't think we need to debunk that now, but there's a yeah, lot of documents. Yeah, it's not in our purview. I only bring it up because I am I am still a little sensitive to some of the comments that were made during the-, during the No, no, I, I totally understand. And we're not like, you know, those are not our comments either but 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 i do want to acknowledge though that you know because we have been in this swirl of you know interviewers knocking down our doors and, and all yeah. this there are written documents from from the city 
that state, the, the link there. And that's where people are getting that link. You know, it's not, it's not, we're not running around accusing anybody, but when the fire chief writes a, a cease and desist letter and says they showed up because of a neighbor's noise complaint, like that's a public document. And that, that has created this narrative that now feels really uncomfortable. So if they, even if they did show up because of the, let's say that's, that's the public narrative, they showed up because there was a noise complaint. They found that you were operating out of the capacity of what was allowed without sprinklers. Like that's, well, no, that's actually that's actually not true. They they designate us as as a nightclub, which um, again, if you want to get into a technical conversation, I'm I'm happy to. But we we are not a nightclub. I agree. I don't think you're a nightclub either. You know, so just just so you know, I'm just trying I'm just trying to point out you have a you have a responsibility. You have this building. You're operating at a capacity that required the sprinklers. End of yes, story. and, and in this right. case, though, we're, we're being held to different standards than other properties in this town. There's, they're like, we again, I don't, I don't think we need to get into. We don't this because it, it's not, it's not relevant. But it actually is. We we were singled out and held to a different set of standards, um, and uh, and and classified in a way that was inappropriate. And we could talk about, you know, the people we've talked to at the state, and you know. Um, but it, it's, that's, that's a whole, that's a whole, that's a right. whole different thing. And the sprinkler installation was always on the table in this project and was discussed with the city before the formation of Bombix. So it is work that we always intended to do. It is just now earlier in our timeline of renovations than we had initially planned based on those conversations. Understood. Um, I have one final question slash thought. Um, and then I'll open it up to Helen and Jennifer if they have further questions and thoughts. But in terms of your being able to increase uh, revenue to meet all of these demands that are on you, is I know you that Laudable Productions does the performances at Mill Pond. Are you restricted in the number of performances that you can have at Mill Pond? Can you do more performances at Mill Pond that might bring in revenue for some of these? High profile acts that separate Bombix and Laudable. Like Laudable making money doing more concerts does not does not impact Bombix's bottom line. Like Bombix makes money renting the venue. Also, Mill Pond is a free concert and doesn't generate, you know, like doesn't doesn't generate revenue. There, there's there's often this misconception in 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 the uh, live music industry that when a whole bunch of people show up, that somebody's making money, and that's it's just not the case. So. Um, I, I dissuade organizations all the time from producing concert fundraisers because they almost always fail to generate a meaningful amount of revenue. Um, we're we're going to be doing crowdfunding. Um, we're hopeful that that we can pour some CPA money into this. Like, there's a lot of productive places that we can go, but you know, benefit concerts are not one of them. Uh, Helen and Jennifer, do you have anything else? We can, it's okay if you don't, we can close the Yeah, I know. I'm just thinking about the, the lot of all discussion. I, ay, ay, ay. Yeah, I just feel like we should talk about that a little further. I mean, if it's the laudable shows that are producing the music. It's not just laudable right. though. You know, it's we are home to Arcadia players and Valley classical concerts, folks like the Happy Valley Guitar Orchestra. This coming month, we have Felipe Salas and Terry Janur and the Cello Festival all producing their events. We also present a lot of concerts with DSP shows and they program throughout the Valley. You know, so it's not like you, it, it's not like there's one sort of offending entity. And, you know, when the shutdown happened, I had no fewer than seven presenters call me and ask me if they needed to move their, you know, their projects that were on the calendar. You know, if we are further restricted in what we are able to do, that's not just, you know, that's not just the loss of rental revenue from Laudable, that's the loss of rental revenue from a plethora of not a, like individual independent producers, larger entities. It, you know, it's, it's unsustainable if we can't have events. And in that coupled with the fact that we now can't have one day you know, liquor licenses means like my weddings, my bar mitzvahs, like it's not just the concert revenue and the performance revenue, it's event revenue across the board, public and private, that's now just dwindling and it's terrifying. Yeah, it's, there, there's a strange irony in the fact that um, 
you know, somehow like the concerts, the fact that your concert venue, maybe not nightclub, um, you know, is what's now caused you, not caused you, um, whatever. Now, and now you're, you're losing revenue through other streams. You know, there, there's something weird going on. There is something weird going on that it's like, it's because of these concerts that have been so successful, that have brought you a name, that have brought a lot of attention and, and goodwill for the most part, you know, that it's because of those that now you you have these restrictions on everything else. Um, it's a statement without a resolution. It doesn't go anywhere, but, but yeah, it puts you in a tricky position. Um, it puts us in a tricky position. I mean, I'm gonna be honest, everyone knows what we're facing. Um, we're essentially making this decision for these neighbors that are they going to continue? Do they have to continue to make sacrifices? And they are making sacrifices. I mean, they moved into this neighborhood for several reasons. And now the neighborhood is something different. And they have to like schedule to be away on on weekends when there's concerts and, and you know, change. They are changing their lives um, to to support what's going on next door. And so now we are in this position of saying, um, I guess, you know, do we continue to, are we going to say these neighbors just have to make those sacrifices because we all believe in the greater good of Bombix succeeding. And now it's just compounded with what's happened recently. And, and now that you have to make all these other investments. Um, also, maybe this isn't moving the conversation forward, but I just, I guess want, I want to express what everyone probably knows that, that we are now faced with, you know, um, so, uh, I wonder, and I still want to say know, that I'm disturbed like, by this this concept of bullying, but but I guess I can't go back there. I don't know because because people are making sacrifices. They're you know. I think like every decision. difficult decision that we've had to make on, make on this con this commission, there's never a happy person. You know, we have to we strive to to when it is difficult like this to find some sort of balance. So, you know. I mean, we just have to do the best job that we can with the information that we've received tonight. Would the commission be open to postponing the decision? I feel like, you know, we have this insulation project in the pipeline and, you know, measuring, measuring sound levels before and after, I think would, you know, provide some meaningful data that we don't have at this time, like, you know, a, it's almost a little premature. Like we've been negotiating our parking agreement for months. We finally got to a place where that is reasonable and have implemented that a week ago. You know, we're poised to do this insulation project. I think we would see some significant impact from that. And it seems to me, you know, worthwhile to have a runway to complete that work, which we've been, you know, shepherding along for many months. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, uh, of the complaints, right? You know, 50% of that is addressing parking which has now reverted to the original arrangement, which we were told, you know, by people in the neighborhood that it was working really well. We're, we're spending $15,000 a year um, to have access to that parking lot, which is, you know, another serious financial hardship, but we felt like it was really important to, you know, to support everybody. Um, I think asking you know, us to postpone the decision portion of this meeting is making an assumption that we're going to vote to take your license away. So I think I think it's important for us to have this opportunity to have our discussion and have a vote. And like everything else, there's there's we we know this is a work in progress. We know that you have this insulation project coming. We know that there are several unknowns surrounding that, one of which is not having um, you know, a reasonable decibel or a decibel count on an evening that's reflective of what you typically do. So there's a lot of moving pieces, but I'm not inclined to delay this decision until the installation is done or did this discussion and vote rather. Yeah, I agree with that. However, thank you for bringing up parking because that has been in the back of my mind the whole time. And just so we, you know, um, discuss that because yes, you have, uh, I was really happy to see this lease arrangement with the parking. And so um, I guess uh, because as you point out, we're getting lots of pictures of cars all over the place. And, and that that is like 50% of the issue, which are we now saying, I guess I'll have to ask you, Kyle and Cassandra, that that this parking should be resolved. The parking issues should be resolved with leasing the space. Well, because again, previously, yeah, sure. did you have the same capacity or the same numbers attending? Yes, we, we had the same capacity. Partner? 
I can answer the question from an operational standpoint and and from, um, again, I can't speak for the neighbors except to say that during meetings last year, when, when we discussed this arrangement, we were applauded for having a situation that worked well because when we look at it from a capacity standpoint, you know, we know how many spaces are next door and, um, and then we have overflow down at the plaza, which is welcomed, you know, because the restaurants are down there and some people just choose to park there anyway. Um, so when we have a full capacity event between the two lots, we're able to park everybody. When we have a medium capacity event, which is frankly most of them, right? We're able to fully park that audience between, you know, with, with the next door lot. Of course, we have 15 spaces too in, in our lot. So um, you know, and, and we're gonna revert now to doing something that's not necessarily legal, but is putting out, you know no parking signs on the street to in, to retrain our audience and encourage them to park in the lots and you know invest in the signage and the time to manage all that to like repattern the audience so that they know that they can park in this place again so from our perspective based on the feedback that we got before um and and our understanding of operationally you know car capacities and so on we believe that this point is now moot that we have we have resolved it that doesn't mean that there won't be you know an errant parker from from time to time, but again, like you know, uh, resolving an issue that has a subjective component is also is, is also a, 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 a it's a confusing place to be because you know we have neighbors that are you know right across the street and and a, and a few doors down the street that have a completely different perception about what that burden is. So it's it's really hard to be in our position, you know, because we're we're getting subjective information that is 180 degrees, you know, from different people who are right here. We're not talking about people that are like at the end of the street or, or far away, you know, so it's anyway, I hope that that's resolved. And, and I hope everybody feels like it's resolved. And I, I guess we're not going to be sure until, you know, right. Yeah, I hope so too. Yeah, I was, I was heartened to see the thing about the parking. So hopefully that resolves those issues. And I also understand that the people whose driveways are blocked are going to be more irked than someone down the street who I'm assuming their driveways are not blocked. But anyway, this hopefully is a new point now with the parking, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Um, yeah. And yeah, and so then it just uh, rests on sound levels, I guess, at this and frequency of concerts um, is sort of what we're looking at. All right. Um, is there a motion then to close the public hearing? I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Okay, so I, um, the request to not vote tonight is not unreasonable based on the insulation projects, but I think that we need to, I don't think it's appropriate to have this meeting and not have a vote about how we're moving forward. And there's certainly other issues to discuss. Um, last year, when we discussed the entertainment license, I was not in favor of the 30 outdoor events. Um, I feel like we tend to err on the side of let's see how this goes then, um, and letting, letting that be the guide. And I don't, and even with only one event, um, recently outside, um, I feel like it's an added layer of problems. Like Kyle talked a lot about this gray area and the concern that they have and anxiety around what's right, what's wrong, who's gonna be upset, who's not. How can you control that when you're outside? You really can't. And, um, you know, we have, there. The, I saw comments on Facebook from patrons who love Bombix who also said, this is a crazy place to have a bomb, have something like Bombix. It's so loud, it's, there's no parking, it's a residential neighborhood, it's all this. So we're not the only ones who are having this conversation. It's kind of, it's it's not, um, um, I, go, I don't know, I guess I'm saying that so that we don't feel like we're in a position of being the bad guys. We're not, we're in a position of using the facts and the data to make a reasonable decision that is helpful. 
um, for the purposes of what we're going to discuss for a vote, I suggest we break it down into sections, first being outside and then being inside entertainment. Um, and then for both of those conversations, we can discuss the hours that are currently allowed and the frequency um, of the events, which I think honestly is the stickiest because of the revenue conversation and not want not wanting to um, further stymie them from being able to reach some of these goals that they have or requirements really. Does that make sense? Yeah, so so you said outdoor. Yep, outside, which right now they have allowed up to 30 events, which is both um, concerts and otherwise. And um, then there's currently three scheduled. Right. Sorry. Um, and then inside frequency of events and timing. Mm -hmm. So um, if we start with the outside, I was not in favor of, of doing the 30. It was an unknown thing. It seems to be, it's a small space. We have an email from John Fry saying it's um, not a suitable place for outside concerts should not be allowed. I don't see how it's possible to have um, any reasonable sound mitigation in that space. I mean, if people in this neighborhood in Florence can hear Look Park, then Look Park can hear our neighborhood here in Florence. Um, so what is your uh, proposal for, it's just for limiting the outdoor shows. Are you saying no outdoor shows or are you saying- No, I, I feel like the, the neighbors are, open to the outdoor shows. You know, I don't, nobody wants to tell, to say that this is something that can't ever happen. And I certainly wouldn't want them to be in a position of unscheduling what's already scheduled. Right. So I, I would be in favor of three to five outdoor events. And that's got to include any amplified events from weddings or bar mitzvahs mm -hmm. or something else related to one of the organizations. And it's the number, honestly, we talked about that at the last, at the last meeting, you know, when we were trying to figure out, well, if it's not 30, then what's the, how do we come to the number? Mm -hmm. We were throwing around three to five. What's your feeling on that, Jennifer? If they have three on the schedule now, I, I don't want to tell them that they can't do any more. That feels a, a little heavy. I, I would propose allowing five amplified events. Is I just want to look at the language because so Are you just, looking at the license itself. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking at the license itself just so yep. we're on the same page because it just reads 30 outdoor events right now. It doesn't say anything about amplification or or what even what kind of event. I mean, well, actually in the list of events. Concerts, lectures, film screenings, poetry readings, dance performances, theater workshops, conferences, again, uh, classes, and multimedia events. So it's it's relatively vague. 120 events per year with up to 30 out with up to 30 outdoor events. Occasional programming lasting until 11 p.m. with notice to neighbors. Just so we know what we're looking at. Um, I just think it's the amplification though that right. affects. The neighbors and that allows the sound to travel further although keeping in mind of course and even kyle talked about this like percussion and things like that whether or not right. they're and, and the brass band the the, uh, the outdoor event that did occur was was not amplified and was loud um yeah but, i think it's um, i think events period yeah should be their our bench benchmark yeah um 
Yeah. And that being said, I mean, I guess I'm thinking six, but I don't know if we should go back. I mean, certainly the three that are already scheduled, you know, I, we're all in agreement that we wouldn't want to put the kibosh on that. Um, and I guess this is just for this year. So um, where are we, Jean? Um, yeah, actually, when you say five, I mean, I'm just thinking of the months that it's reasonable to have events outdoors. That's essentially like that would be an average of one per month through October, right? And then you'd think that although with climate change, we could be warm in November and December, but right. I think it's still unlikely that there would be outdoor events um, at that time. But, um, and just so we, and so they are clear, when we talk about outdoor events, events like this is where it gets into this gray area for me i mean if you were doing say an outdoor lecture you know is that the same in my mind that's not the same as doing an outdoor concert um so and this is where i'm hedging so at the same time you know i don't know if there's language where we can say and it sounds like amplified is not the answer where it's like when we're talking about those five or six or whatever it ends up being outdoor events, it doesn't um, mean that you couldn't gather people outside, you know, um, for some event that didn't, you know, that wasn't loud. I don't, I don't know how to say that another way. And uh, does that make sense? I just don't want them to be in this fuzzy position where it's like, hey, let's bring this outside where we're gathering in a circle and talking to each other, but oh, it's not allowed in our entertainment license. Or is it just a general understanding? And I know they're listening right now, you know, that what we're talking about is we're limiting to them to announce uh, events where sound will, will travel. If, yeah, I mean, if we're talking, it's an entertainment license. It's right. It's not a workshop outside license. That's not entertainment to me. You know, so, yes. so, so <laughs> we want to try and define what the entertainment license is, and it would be amplified music, live or otherwise. Or not amplified, or comedy. Or comedy. <laughs> That's what we've come up against. Yeah. Um. um. <sighs> So we're we're somewhere between three and six, the three of us. Mm -hmm. And Natasha, I mean, do you propose that we go through the description of entertainment and X out items that you don't think are are contentious? Do we what have do that you, authority? What do you mean? What are you referring to? Well, you just said a moment ago that you didn't feel like a workshop was entertainment. Well, yeah, I mean, just like, it's in, like if it's, people are going outside to talk in a circle, obviously that's not something that would be re require a license to do. Right. So, but it is in that, I'm sorry, but it is in that paragraph. Which paragraph are you referring to? The description of entertainment, the description of amusement slash entertainment. From the Mass uh, General Law? No, on the license. I'm looking at the license. Oh, I'm not, I don't have the license in front of me. I'm sorry. That's okay. Did you read it again? Sure, the description of uh, amusement slash entertainment lists concerts, lectures, film screenings, poetry readings, dance performances, theater workshops, conferences, classes, and multimedia events, 120 events per year with up to 30 outdoor events. I apologize. Uh, sorry, I thought there was an issue in the kitchen that I was. Oh, yeah. about. Um, so I'm sorry if I missed anything. So we're just talking about the detail of what's listed in the description of amusements and entertainment. Right, right. on the on the actual license. Yep. Annie, where did that list come from? Can you remind us? Is that a stand? Is that a it stand? Came, it came from the application. Okay. Well, I mean. I would be happy to ask a question of, uh, um, sorry, I'm just uh, distracted by texts that are coming in. Um, I don't know, it seems, it seems to me having a lecture outside is not an offensive amplified event. <laughs> right. 
I agree. I just don't want Bombix to feel like unnecessarily penalized by totally. yep. this no, language. I yeah. Yep. I appreciate that. Um, then we can modify that on the license and limit it to outdoor amplified. Um, more loud, unamplified. I mean, I, I just don't know. Yeah, why. right. We had the language for it. Um, yeah. I mean, is the concert open ended enough? Um, I mean, I guess, yeah. Or is it um, uh, events where sound will travel? But I mean, I guess that could be anything. But it's well, a, I think these things are more reasonable people, and we understand what it means. And I, and I, so anyway, I don't want to get bogged down in it. And it looks like if we feel at this point, we could. It looks like I don't know if Kyle Newley has his hand raised, but hand raised. If, and, if, and if, I know if, just this this list as it's outlined on the license refers to everything. It's not just the outside. So I think that's why it's such a comprehensive list because it refers to the 120 events. And it's the, it's one it's one paper license. It's true. It's in the, the definition. You're right. Right. So I think we're getting into the weeds a little bit with with worrying about about that if we want to separate it out i would be satisfied with separating out the number of events for outside for amplified music or unamplified but loud well then we can't define that so then we have to say <laughs> unamplified or amplified. i have no problem i know you were the chair um but i it does look like Kyle's desperate to say something. I think this might be in addition okay. to whatever we discussed. Kyle, tonight. we will take what you <laughs> have to say, but then we really need to keep moving on. I, I, I'm just saying that you, in this decision, you need to consider that it's not just Bombix. Like you can't, you can't address this just as Bombix because we have a synagogue and a church that do like, you know, like we're talking about bar mitzvahs here. We don't do bar mitzvahs. The synagogue does bar mitzvahs, right? And but they don't um, have a license for that. They don't come to us. This this entertainment license is for Bombex. It's not for the synagogue or the church or the preschool. This is your license. Okay, but but so we just we're just gonna need some clarity from you from what that means. Because for example, like the, the synagogue does services outside on nice days in the backyard. And I think they they put up a speaker because you know they have whatever 50 people and they want them to hear the person who's speaking. But it's just it, you know guidance around that or what that means for the other partners who are in the building would just be important, you know, because we've got these other entities who who are also responsible for, you know, events, events that go on. So like, I really one thing that like just, say concerts, but you know, anyway, I, I appreciate that, that you pointed that out. And it's you're right, there are the church and the synagogue are doing their own thing. If their congregations want to be outside, they're going outside. But for the purposes of this license, we're, we're really talking about the four and a half percent of the programming that this license applies to. You know, this this isn't this is an entertainment license for Bombix. Um, I'm not I'm not as I'm not I, we have gotten zero complaints about church events. Well, except that, the, I mean, this goes back to the whole issue of bar mitzvahs and stuff like that. And now I'm going to say I'm confused because, yes, this entertainment license reads that it's granted to Bombix Center for Arts and Equity. And in the original, um, you know, when we gave this license was the 120 events per year, inclusive of everything. I don't know if that was inclusive of if, if a, like a church service wants to move outside. Yeah. If Bombix is renting the facility to the church, to the wedding, to the bar mitzvah, then it then it falls underneath the license. So I, my understanding was all the bar mitzvahs and everything that was now part of a rental of the Bombix facility, right? Separate from the church wanting to go outside for their service. That's a different thing. That's not an entertainment. Laces, laces. Okay, except that I think we need to be clear. If we are saying there are six outdoor events um, allowed within a year, then that does mean that a, if they've exceeded that or whatever, then a bar mitzvah cannot move outside or a wedding service cannot move outside because even in our discussion back in October last year, I think it was Cassandra who was like very um, forcefully making the argument for some reason that that a bar mitzvah and a concert are the same because you're because you are. It, it's loud and there's music and and it travels through the neighborhood. Well, so, because it becomes a rental of the facility. 
Right. So I just want to, for clarification, when we say a limit of six outdoor events, then that's going to include those are all folded in, just so everyone's on the same page. So, which means there may have to be the choice that that event is held inside. Yeah. If there's amplified music, then then yeah, then the event can happen, but the amplification has can't. A dance after a bar mitzvah or wedding could happen inside. It doesn't have to happen outside. Okay. So we're not saying those things can't happen. That's why I'm hung up on the amplification piece. Right. Because that allows for the difference of, of how a space is being used. Right. We can't say people can't go outside. We can only issue this license can only speak to what is considered entertainment outside. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> no, I don't think it does by the look on your face. Yeah, sure. Okay. So all that being said. Are we at six? I mean, essentially, I mean, I think people know what we're trying to do. It's like, it's, yeah, loud events that will impact the neighborhood, however you define those. Um, so, um, yeah. And just so everyone recognizes that essentially what we're saying is we're saying we are allowing like them to be outside of the decibel limit at these six different occasions throughout the year because we, we all know that it'll be very difficult <laughs> to keep that below 65 decibels. Yeah, and, and I can tell you the sole reason I'm okay with that is because the neighbors have said they're okay with it. Yeah. A secondary reason for that is because we, are, we do not want to eliminate opportunities for this organization to move forward with what has been required of them. And because there's still the option, although we're getting to that, of, of having events inside. So. Yes. Yes. And I want to, for the outdoor piece, there needs to be a, plan, a floor plan submitted. Like every other entertainment venue or anybody having an entertainment license, we need a floor plan for the outside, where the music is going to be. And then the capacity, there has to be confirmation that the capacity will not exceed the capacity for the indoor license. Mm -hmm. Do we want to vote on each separate? Do you want one vote on all of the topics we're going to discuss or vote outside, vote inside? I think we should do, I think we should make decisions on each individual piece and then make it one. Okay. Motion. That's what okay. I think. Um, I will say I'm at six outdoor events, but I know there's two others and I know that we don't all have to be in agreement. So Great. I will um, go on board with six outdoor events. Yep. I agree with six. Okay. All right, moving inside. Yes, let's move mm -hmm. inside. Um, inside, we, as Cassandra pointed out, we there's efforts being made for insulation. We don't have the data that is what we need to require uh, base decisions on. Um, because of that, and I want that process to happen, I want that opportunity to happen to collect the data. I, I'm not inclined to uh, limit the frequency of the events. I think that the on average of two per week gets complicated when we have events such a tightly packed week and there's so much density, but I do, you know, in the conversation that we had tonight and hearing that it's a curatorial process and that they do give deference to that and consider it. Um, I feel okay with with not making any changes to the frequency until we have information and revisit the conversation after we've had the opportunity for data collection. Yep, I agree with that. I agree with that 100%. One 
issue that seems to be conflicting is um, the timing that events are getting out. So there's a time on their license and there was an informal agreement with the neighborhood um, that was established, I think when the mayor was working with them all on this. Um, I think that there are nights where, you know, when you have this density of several shows a week and they're not getting out until 10 o'clock, I think that becomes in intense on a neighborhood. And again, we're, you know, I'm reminded of the, um, I don't know where it is, but the the mass general law that we're guided by in terms of um, unreasonable increase in noise in the area caused by license activity, et cetera, et cetera. So I would be inclined to propose a um, shift to the ending of events so that the license mirrors the informal agreement with the neighborhood. Can you remind us what the informal agreement is? The informal agreement is 9 p.m. on weekdays and 10 p.m. on weekends. Currently, it is um, 10 and 11. And like everything else, every license can be revisited with more information and more data. No, I, I accept that to make the informal agreement part of the formal agreement. Uh, I, I will tell you what I'm doing. I'm flipping through the things that they have scheduled already, and I'm trying to see if that's going to throw off anything that they have scheduled. And I can't tell what a weekend is and what. So, and it looks like the majority of them start at seven. I don't know how long these go. I'm sure they could answer us um, if we let them. Um, I see one starting at 8 p.m. Um, I would not, I would not at all. I mean, it's not reasonable to say to people, you have to make this change tomorrow. You have contract contracts and everything else. I'm not opposed to having this begin in July or something, or, you know, a month out from now since they've already booked. The later shows are actually a little bit later in the season. But eight, but if that's on a weekend, which I assume it is, can we can we include language that states like four new bookings? Can we? I know that feels sort of in the weeds to me as well, but I do feel that some deference should be given to the hand waving is distracting right now. We just need to have this conversation. I know you want to talk, but let us finish a thought. I'm sorry, it's just really kind of distracting to see that. Jennifer, please continue. I, I just didn't know if you wanted to include some sort of um, wording um, to allow the shows that are already scheduled to continue mm -hmm. at that set time, if we can include language limiting new bookings, or if that's an area that, that you don't want to go to. Do you know what I mean? It's... How far out is the calendar booked? Do you have it open, Helen? Yeah, um, so I think the eight o'clock was actually September. September. Um... 29. You know what? I actually do. I have a question for Kyle and Cassandra. You responded rather vehemently to this. Why? Why is that? It, well, so first of all, like I just want to point out that in good faith, we have we've started all shows at seven o'clock. And believe me, there's a lot of people who don't like that. And and that means that shows typically end by nine o'clock. That's weekends too. We actually don't go. The only show we had scheduled to go later was Collider Fest, which was canceled when we got shut down. Every other show on our calendar, you will see starts at seven o'clock and almost all shows run 90 minutes to, to two hours, right? So they end at nine o'clock, but it's a non-starter for us. Um, if like, if we're in the, in the, now in the position of policing, when a band is on, they do an encore, they play another 10 minutes or something, and we have to like get up and stop stop the music and tell the audience we're shutting it down. Like we're just done. It's not, well, we can't this, do that. This, first of all, this was this was your informal agreement with the neighbors to, to yeah, come to which, which we Which we have upheld. Right, which is great, which is fantastic. I think it's important that an, a, an agreement you've made with neighbors mirrors the what we have on paper. That's just being organized. That's not having any loose ends. It's, it's, I don't think anybody is going to be policing you if there's an encore until nine ten. I oh, think that the 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 idea 
of, you know, this is all, this is what I said, we're going to do things that aren't going to make everybody happy. But what we're asking for is what you're already say you're doing to mirror what your license is going to say. So that should not be a problem. But the structure of the informal agreement gives us flexibility so that, for example, you know, when we have an event that runs a few minutes long, we can, an artist can do an encore or an artist, you know, we have a band with an opener. There's a teen talent show coming up this week that, you know, it's a great bunch of seniors from the high school and they decided to invite a few extra friends. Like, you know, we need that flexibility. We have been voluntarily self-limiting and most things end at nine or shortly thereafter. But occasionally we do need to be able to go later than that. I think that we have demonstrated our good faith effort to work within the neighbor's concerns and to hear them. But I don't want our license to be so limited that, for example, I have to tell, you know, ILI the next time they're organizing their fundraiser that like they have to be out by nine. Like that just makes the opportunities for rental so much, like it so constrains what we do. Well, and, and really, I mean, like, like, <laughs> like the, the, uh, it, it is it is an incredible amount of pressure to make sure that everybody like that a, that a show concludes at a specific time like getting up and, and shutting down a show like I we don't trust actually that that won't be enforced or that won't be cited like with there's there's nobody else in town that has a nine o'clock curfew you there's, know if for, you if you have a fundraiser if I like ILI comes for a fundraiser that's not a musical event why would they have to be out by nine we're talking about we are talking about your entertainment license. We're talking about how to help mitigate the sound currently with and 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 in a collective effort to try and help make this work. Right, but but ILI falls under the entertainment license. Every every wow. entity in this building is a renter of ours, by the way. So every event is ultimately a rental that falls, you know, under that because Bombix is managing the property, right? We're talking about amplified music. We are talking about amplified music and music in the concerts that you're having. Fundraising events are are not considered a music. concert. We had a band who wanted to do a fundraiser for Ukraine and they rented the space and they presented a concert. All of those musicians decided that, you know, they weren't going to collect a fee themselves and that all that ticket revenue would go towards this particular family. It, that is a fundraiser. That is a rental. It, it, it's, it's also if, if you if you, you know, if you read the the neighbor's letters, like we, we understand that when a concert lets out, particularly a full concert and people spill outside. Right. There, there's additional noise that's happening, not because it's amplified sound. Right. But just because people are going to their cars. Yeah. And um. You know, so so the so even if we if we had a non music event and went until ten o'clock, like we're still generating noise later. I, all we're saying is like, the the more you squeeze us to put these limitations on, the less viable this becomes. And and the, you know, it's we're in a pretty hard place already. So at some point, it's just not worth it. And we have demonstrated consistently the good faith to do this, and the flexibility is really important so that we can, you know, operate and not be you know, not be running this place in fear every day that we're we're running over a time limit. Um, so it 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 feels it feels really unreasonable and 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 is definitely something that would cause us to pause and say, can this project continue um, under those constraints? So just say that much. I'm going to add this time frame is one you designed. In your informal agreement with the neighbors, so That's right, which, which, which is right, but it's 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 yes, and was we have it to, to to put that those numbers out there in your informal agreement, or was it? It's it's not it's not an enforceable it's not a binding enforceable thing where we can get shut down because something goes half an hour late, right? So now you're saying we're making it an enforceable thing, and so if we've done a good job with something, we're now being penalized for having done a good job with something like. We we have voluntarily you know done this and and we have had we have a really solid track record. That's why every single show on the calendar starts at seven p.m. But again, if we're in this position where our, our the team of people who try to make this go around every night and and whether it's a rental that has a music component or it's the trans health benefit and their event is running long, like if if we're policing this with an earlier curfew, then I, I'm really not sure that we're going to do this. Um, and it's not because 
we're not trying to comply. We've already demonstrated that we do comply. And we put on the earliest shows of anybody presenting music. You know, the VFW goes until midnight. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we can't, we're not going to make it with a bunch more handcuffs on here. It's not, it's not going to happen. So, you know, I know you guys are trying to make difficult decisions, but I, I don't think that limiting, like, because we're already demonstrating good faith there, I'm not quite sure why that's the thing that you're trying to limit of something that, that is already a, a non-issue, you know, and good faith efforts, I, uh, good faith efforts and the reality of impact are two different things. Nobody's denying that you are making good faith efforts, but right now the impact is still too great of this organization, this, this the nighttime entertainment on this neighborhood. That is what we're trying to help manage. We're not trying to handcuff you. We're not trying to squeeze you. We're not trying to shut you down. We are trying to make this Oh, we, we realize that you're not trying to do those things, but but there will be consequences to further limitations and it may shut us down. So like that, that's the reality here. And um, again, putting putting a nine o'clock deadline on us seven days a week does not solve. It wasn't seven problem. days a week. And that, it was not seven days a week. It was nine o'clock on the weeknights, 10 o'clock on the weekends. And I feel like this is getting a little adversarial right now, this conversation, because I feel like you're threatening us a little bit with with what oh, our role we're is. Not, we we're not threatening. We're we're. Uh, I mean, I can couch it or I can be real with you. Like, I mean, I, I, I assume. That I, I think we should couch it. So I want to be clear: the hours, so you completely understand, where the weeknights 9 p.m., the weekends 10 p.m. I never said 9 p.m. seven nights a week. That was okay. that was not brought up. It was to bring the hours that you have in an informal agreement formally to the piece of paper so that everybody's on the same page. Because I think part of the major stress right now has been lack of, of clarity on what's required. And, you know, right, it doesn't, it doesn't English, address you know I don't want to have that happen with your licenses. And we're, we're painstakingly now four hours into a meeting trying to uh, have some real clarity around this, okay? So I would like to go back to the discussion, unless you have something different to add. Well, I, I do want to add one other thing, which is I realized that, you know, there are five households who signed this most recent letter um, that was shared with city departments. And, you know, we have seen, you know, as many households come to this meeting and share that, you know, even though they live in proximity to Bombix and also, you know, participate in the program that they have a very different subjective experience of these, you know, of these same events, of our same activities. So I just want to make sure that we're thinking carefully about how we balance, you know, a few very vocal neighbors against, you know, a similar number of neighbors who have, you know, who live in the neighborhood, who have experiences and have a very different response to them. I completely understand that. In any conversation, we're going to bring people to the table who are having different responses to what's happened. And I'm going to point out, we have given deference to that in the fact that we are not limiting how the frequency of your concerts. We specifically are not limiting what you're able, the nights, how many you're able to have inside of that building. We're not. And that's exactly why, because everybody has a different perspective and it's, you know, a butter. So people immediately surrounding that building are going to have an experience that's different from the people who are three or four houses out. That's just how it is. We're trying to meet the needs of everybody. Okay. This isn't, this isn't a meeting to meet the needs of five households. I can assure you of that. All right. We're going to return to our discussion then. Okay. Uh, back to the the time, based on what we've just heard and discussed with Kyle and Cassandra, do you feel differently about having the license match what has been informally agreed to already with the neighbors? Which would be 9 p.m. on weekdays, 10 p.m. on weekends. Currently, it is 10 and 11. Annie, can you tell me, is it 10 Monday through Thursday or Monday through Friday? It is um, tonight I have in front of me. 
30 a.m. to is it Monday through Saturday to 10 p.m. Is that the question? Yeah, so I, I can tell you too. It's it's until 10 p.m. every night right okay. now. As it reads, the only difference is when the entertainment starts. It starts at 1 p.m. on Sundays and 8.30 a.m. the rest of the days. Right? And occasional programming lasting until 11 with notice. With notice to the, to the neighbors. neighbors, yes. Um, I will say, um, and I hadn't spoken to this before um, we allowed a lot of talk from Kyle and Cassandra, which is unusual, just so you know. I've been at other mission meetings, and usually after the hearing is closed, there's no allowance for that talk. So we've been generous. But um, but even aside from all that, I I <laughs> um was hesitating. I was going to hesitate about changing the hours. Um, and because um, um, part of the reason and part of the thing that the neighbors are talking about is parking, which I hope will no, no longer be an issue. Uh, but I know it's also about letting letting um, what happens after the concert lets out or after the entertainment lets out. Um, so, and, you know, I mean, I was leaning towards, I, I think if we do change something, I mean, I think it should read probably Monday through Thursday would be a different time because I'm assuming Friday is one of the times when you want to be able to go late. Um, and in fact, I don't know why you'd go late. So, I mean, if you really want to sort of be reasonable about it, it'd be like Friday and Saturday, I can get, go later Sunday through Thursday. It's a different thing. But but honestly, I, I don't want to cur curtail it that mon much. Um, I sort of hope that they do you stay to this sort of informal agreement? And then, you know, I don't know. Or if we are changing the hours, you know, put in occasional programming lasting till X time, because I, I, I too don't want to be in that situation where they're concerned, you know, that something's going to go 15 minutes over. Um, and I don't think the neighbors are unreasonable and feel that way too. I don't think, and I certainly hope not, that they're going to be looking at their stopwatch and, and figuring that out. Um, anyway. Uh, I don't know if that helps, but, um, so I, I, but I'll just say I'm, I'm hesitating on changing the hours very much. Um, and I don't know if changing it a half hour, you know, on, on weekdays is, is helpful either. But so, but your suggestion is, and I, sorry, I keep asking this. It was 9 PM weeknights, 10 PM weekends. Right, and weeknights could just be, I mean, sun, like if it were Sunday through Thursday, 9 p.m., Friday, Saturday, 10 p.m., no change to those nights. And then still allow occasional programming mm -hmm. until 11 p.m. Yep. And just so those listening understand, if we're saying occasional pro programming lasting until 11 p.m., then that gives leeway on some of those um, weeknight concerts as well that they might go over or events you know i think i think if we're talking about you know going back to perception this is so much of perception how how many they just responded so adamantly around having a license go until nine because even though their license goes until 10 they always wrap it up around nine anyways then Yes, there's going to be some wiggle room on things going out. I don't think anybody's going to be calling the police at night. Nobody's, I mean, that's not happening anyway. So right. um, it's, again, part of the perception and trying to heal this problem that's happening with, with what the neighbors are experiencing and what Bombix says is happening, right? If the perception is that the license is matching an informal agreement, I think people are going to feel a lot better and we and Bombix will hear a lot less mm -hmm. of these concerns. Um, right. And keeping in mind that JJ's is limited to 8.30. Yeah. Yep. Once a week. Yep. Um, for outdoor. Yep. But JJ's is in a commercial district also. You know, JJ's, to be clear, JJ's is in a commercial district and none of the abutters are nearly as close to JJ's as any of the abutters are or neighbors are to um, Bombix. 
to a number of the neighbors we heard from tonight, certainly not all of them, but to some of them. And again, and Bombix also had their extreme challenges with sound being that their performances were in the back of the building, noise is bouncing off of brick walls, going out into this huge parking lot. There was there were different concerns there, but we certainly restricted them. And we haven't heard any complaints. Bombix has, uh, JJ's has their music. Um, it's managed. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Helen. Sorry. No, nothing. And and this is sort of just just as predicted. Having gone back and and watched what, what we were discussing in October, it is much harder to walk things back than to expand them outward. Um, however, I know we're in the process of walking things back a little bit, but um, in a way that really won't bite. <laughs> um, um, but that that should help the neighbors a bit. Um, I mean, so that being said, I mean, I, I would be open to um, a rewrite of it as, um, what did we talk about, Sunday through Thursday until 9, uh, Friday, Saturday until 10 with occasional programming until 11, which gives the flexibility that some of those shows may go over. And I don't think anyone's going to be calling the cops on them. No. Um, but I think it also makes it easier for Bombix to explain to the, the people who are coming in, this is the restrictions, you know, it makes it easier on their end too with, um, you know, I mean, they're already doing it, but now mm -hmm. they have sort of something behind them to say, this is why we're doing it. Um, And all this being said, if all the insulation and everything goes great, then you know this uh, the, it can be amended in a different direction for for next year. If we find out that everything goes swimmingly after all that insulation is put on, that that would be great. There was a question that's been sort of uneasy weighing on me that we're giving the benefit of the doubt with the parking remedy, but we're not giving the same benefit with the insulation and with the HVAC and the closed windows and then the window. Uh, phase three of the work so well I will say I mean one difference is that one is immediate the parking is immediate and the other even if it goes great phase three I'm, I'm not even sure when phase three happens on that so so I think it's clear there's going to continue to be it's going to continue to be loud you know not because they're not trying to do anything but just because of the nature of the building and the way sound travels that's going to continue for for some time So where are we? So um, to review, we are at outside six uh, concerts or events. Um, frequency is fine, leaving that alone. And so now we're just down to um, if we are changing the time. Jennifer, what were your thoughts on that? On adjusting the time to match, loosely match the informal agreement? I thought that was a fair compromise to address the, the unique challenges of, of this performance venue being in a residential neighborhood. Uh, but I, I certainly don't want to shut them down. I mean, my goal is not to, to give anyone, you know, financial harm, but I mean, the license says, you know, that, that we have the right to amend, right? I, I've got so many documents now. I know. Plus the, they've adversely affected the public health safety or order. You know, and, and the neighbors do feel adversely affected. So I know it feels harsh, but I, I think that because we're at this point, it just feels to me that it, that the informal agreement has to be incorporated in the formal agreement to lessen the harm. And, you know, I have to point out that prior to this coming to us, um, back when the efforts were being made to have the zoning changed, 
all of these concerns, you know, I reread all of the minutes from those meetings and all of these concerns were brought forward at that time. And the position of the planning board was that this is for license to deal with because they can create the stringent regulations. So this ball rolled down the hill and landed with us. And in the time that that has happened, this is a, an organization with an incredible amount of community support, rightfully so, um, that has grown in capacity, which has directly poked the concerns that were brought forward to begin with that weren't really considered when the zoning was changed for this location. Um, so I want to acknowledge that I, I don't really appreciate that it's come to us at this point. I don't think that that's the best way for um, for these zoning changes to have been handled. I, I wish that more had been considered at that point in time in terms of neighborhood impact. I think that is what zoning is about. Um, but because the change was made, knowing that it would be ours to deal with, we unfortunately have to deal with it. And that's why I think where I think the um, mass general law that Jennifer just referenced is is helpful. This is what we have to make, you know, to use to make these decisions when we have to amend something or when we've we've we are considering an amendment. Um, with that said, do we need to uh, discuss further the hours? I don't think so. Um, yeah, and just to point out, like, I think this doesn't preclude something like a weekend blowout collider fest. Right, absolutely. Um, you know, because there is the occasional programming I guess I'd recommend next time don't advertise it by saying call the fire department because this one's going to be hot. It's going to be so hot. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that there's someone regretting that I advertising. Yeah. Because it did yeah. happen. Yeah. Um, I think, and yes, thank you for bringing that up because like everything else, there's all, there's exceptions. There's always additional programming and events and communication to happen. And just like they they had the occasional 11 p.m. with informing the neighbors, they can inform the neighbors when they have a weekend long collider fest. You know, that's that hasn't changed. Yeah. All right. Are we ready for a motion four hours later? Right. Um, I just want to point out for the time on the motion, um, the hours. So Sundays starts at one, I think is how the license oh, yeah. reads. Um, so a motion yeah. should reflect 830 to 10. I'm sorry, 830 to 9. Oh, right. Monday, through Thursday. 8.30 to 10 Friday and Saturday, and one to nine on Sundays. You're saying that in a way like you're not making the motion. That's what I'm hearing in that. <laughs> Is that what I'm hearing? Did you pick up what I'm laying down? Uh, 1 p.m. Oh, God. Um, okay, so for guidance, um, Annie, would the motion be made in a way that um, the entertainment license will be amended to say? Is that essentially how that motion is? Sorry. Is, is there just in terms of the language for the motion? Um, it's just, uh, I'm just looking for guidance. Um, is it just basically making a motion to amend the entertainment license with the following changes. Yeah. Um, and so the reasoning behind it is to make yeah. it because it, there needs to be right. um, and I can get you that I can I sent yeah. the language earlier. Um, right. 
We need to state the reason for the amendment. Right, thank you. So is it because to align with the informal agreement already made? Is that the reason? Um, and to limit adverse effects to the neighborhood, is that? Yep. Oh my goodness. Okay, so uh, are we ready? Am I giving this a shot? Um, ready? <laughs> make a motion um, to hang on one sec. Excuse me. Right at the beginning. Uh, make a motion to modify the entertainment license held by Bombic Center for Arts and Equity located at 130 Pine Street, Florence, um, to mitigate adverse impacts on the neighborhood and to more closely align with the informal agreements made between Bombix and the neighbors. And the changes are that um, outdoor events will be limited to six for the year. Um, and all events will be conducted on uh, from Monday through Thursday between the hours of 8.30 a.m. and 9 p.m. Friday and Saturday between the hours of 8.30 and 10 p.m. and Sunday between the hours of 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. The second. Second. Natasha. Yes. Helen. Yes. And Jennifer. Yes. Okay. Item 13, request to rescind three previously approved short-term liquor licenses for Building 8 Brewing. This is for Bombix 130 Pine Street in Florence, Live Music Wine and Malt, and the dates were May 12th and May 13th from 3 to 10 p.m. and May 27th from 6 to 9 p.m. Yeah, so these, obviously these um, events weren't held, so we, uh, O'Brien, or building eight no longer needed the yep. licenses. Great. We don't need, do we need to vote on that? Yes, please. I'll just make a, okay. I'll make a motion to rescind the three previously approved short-term liquor licenses for building eight brewery as detailed in item 13 on the agenda. Second. And Natasha? Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. And I think we skipped over item 12. Did we? That was yeah, the which... possible vote. So I don't know if we want to um, table this. So I had brought this up because of everything that has gone down recently. Um, oh, we need to skip it. Sorry. sorry yeah. Sorry. So anyway, sorry, should I keep talking about it? <laughs> Are we on item 12? Um, just so I brought it up because of in light of it, all the events that have recently happened, um, I had the sense that the license commission was a little bit blindsided about all these other regulations that we're not aware of for people to be operating and having the types of entertainment licenses that we are approving. And so my question was, do we need to add any sort of language into our entertainment licenses or change the process in any way to uh, reflect that all these things are contingent upon the, you know, these entities meeting the requirements of other city departments or something like that? Or is that not necessary? Can I sort of add to that yeah. before you answer, Annie? Yeah. Um, so I had a conversation with Annie's counterpart in East Hampton because I wanted to um, gather some more information about outdoor entertainment licenses that or entertainment licenses in general that have been amended and how like specifically I know Fort Hill 
had an issue with uh, sound complaints of their outdoor music and New City Brewery had, a, had an issue, but something that she said that would um, address that, Helen, is East Hampton's entertainment applications have to be signed off by both fire department and the building department. Oh. Or they come to the license commission. So when something like a, a venue like Bombix, they would have gone, had to have signed off by these other two critical departments before coming to us. Wow. Wouldn't that have been great? That would well, be helpful. Yeah. And I know I've oh. complained in the past that we, we deal with entertainment licenses and Annie always says, well, it's part of, it's a license. <laughs> so I respect that, but this is just a really glaring example of why maybe we shouldn't be the first people to deal with an entertainment license on a new concert venue, because yeah. that's what we had to do. And so what happened, it was, you know, there were issues with building department that needed to be addressed. There were yep. issues with fire that needed to be addressed. All of which we are unaware of because that right. is right. Yeah. You know, Right. Yeah, it I feels know. bureaucratic, but it would have forced the conversation. It would have right. made yeah. people accountable and yeah. Well, and for for Bombix, it would have hopefully um given them the opportunity to better plan on some of these right. requirements that are now placed on them. So it's you know, it's it's a it's would have been much better for everybody. Yes, it would have been better for us, but it really most of all would have been better for Bombix. Right. If, if that process had happened. So I, I would advocate for that change. I don't know what that entails. Um, I know that they use an online application portal thing in East Hampton that I don't think we use. So maybe check in with them and see. Which we will be using soon. Nice. Um, and, there, and there is a process by which we could add an approval step. Um, it will, it's just, we're just starting implementation and licensing is going first. Um, so, it's, but um, I guess with that said, it's gonna be probably years before every city department is on board, yeah. Yep. But this, you know, like every, everything has been so extra with license commission since COVID with all of the outdoor dining, outdoor entertainment, so much of what we're dealing with, we never had to deal with before. So with each challenge, we've, we've figured out how to do this better and what the blind spots are for us, what the blind spots are for people who are coming in with applications. And in the future, if we get an application from somebody who's, who's doing what looks, looks and smells like a concert venue, um, we have some additional questions that we now know we have to ask before we approve it. Because I think had we known what we all now know, that license probably wouldn't have been approved to the extent with the breadth of um, allowances that it had. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I don't know if like, we. it sounds like this is a discussion. I don't know that we have the power to vote to I amend think I was gonna the say, Right. Can this be researched and can we talk about it at the next meeting or? I mean, because this is obviously this, the suggestion you're making, Natasha, means buy-in from, you know, right. building fire. Right. It means buy-in and it also, yeah. like, I have no problem in the future the next time something like this comes to us saying, no, we can't approve this license because we don't, we don't know. Have you been through building department? Have you closed all your permits? Have you been to the fire department? Do you have a sprinkler for capacity? Do you have all of these things? Right. Like, and, and it seems like we shouldn't be the ones asking those questions. We should just exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> we, then we have to on on this small stipend that we're getting. Right. Um, <laughs> camaraderie. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, but I, I think it's an interesting proposal. So I guess, to, yeah, what are the the, the next? Yeah, steps? next steps. Is that, my, is that? I don't know if we're all looking, well, I guess looking for Annie, at you, I, I wherever know, you are at, on our screen, Annie. Yeah, I'm looking at Annie <laughs> as our leader. I mean, I don't know. Um, 
I don't know. I I can I can bring it to the mayor. Yes. Yeah, that would be helpful. Yeah. It's it's only it would only serve really to benefit everybody. Yeah. And I know the mayor has to do some entertainment licenses too, so it may then apply to that as well. Right. In fact. It yep. was going, this was going to be hers. Uh. Yep. Um, moving on to approval of minutes. Sure. I make a motion. Can we just jump to that? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes, May 3rd, 2023. Second. Okay. Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Um, new business. Dare I say it? Annie, can you call the building department and schedule a couple of <laughs> decimal counts? Might be helpful to have one earlier and then one after the date of the installation installation. So that's at the end of the summer, right? Mm -hmm. I thought they said the end of June. Uh, no, I don't think so. Oh. I think they're getting started at the end of June. Oh, okay. they're starting, yeah. Just scribbled it down somewhere. But yeah, I don't think that's, I mean, I think if all goes smoothly, it might be at the end of July. But... Yeah. The, but yeah, we should get started on that, organizing that and confirming the process around it. Um, the decibel checks? Yes, yep. Okay. Anything else from anybody? Okay. Yeah. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. And Natasha? Yes. Helen? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.